Welcome to Hold on, send it to Kagan. Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs. Yeah. Uh, welcome uh, to the Education Affairs uh, Committee 1 p.m. hearings today. We have uh, eight or 10 bills. Uh, I want to welcome the committee members, our uh, guest panelists who will be uh, testifying, and people who are watching via YouTube in terms of streaming. We will have the sponsor go first. We will have uh, his or her witnesses. Uh, the first one can use up to five minutes. They don't have to use all five minutes. Uh, subsequent um, testimony is limited to two and a half minutes. We will do um, favorable people in support, then favorable with amendments, and then opposition if there is any. Some of today's bills do not have opposition. And committee, I would point out, there may not be opposition in oral testimony, but there may be some in written testimony. And I will try to point that out if that's the case in a bill. With that being said, she's still not here. Okay, we're, we uh, will go to Senate Bill 34, Senator Lamb, State Board of Physicians, Genetic Counselors Licensing. Senator, want to unmute him? Uh, can you unmute uh, Senator Lamb? No, he can't. Oh, now, I think I just did now. Yeah, sorry, yeah. earlier it wasn't letting me unmute myself, so. It's no problem. Sure, so happy to um, uh, introduce SB 34. I think we do have a witness panel. Um, if I could have the sponsor panel also um, participate as well. Um, we have Dr. Riker from Anne Arundel County Medical Center. Uh, we have Carolyn Applegate from uh, Johns Hopkins, and I believe we also have Lisa Schlager from um, Force, which is facing uh, hereditary cancer empowered. So, um, Lamoria, I think I have slides. I don't know if you can bring those up to share with the uh, committee, and then I can just signal to you when to move to the next slide if that works. Pulling them up now. Excuse me? Pulling them up now. Okay, all right, great, thanks. So um, while you do that, um, I can at least begin. Um, so the, this bill, um, SB, uh, sorry, I guess, let me, let me just introduce myself. Clarence Lamb, Center District 12. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Vice Chair, members of the committee. Um, this bill, SB 34, is to establish a pathway for licensure for genetic counselors. The members of this committee who were part of this committee last session probably recognize this bill as well. Um, we did have a bit of discussion on it, and it did pass actually out of the um, Senate unanimously, uh, but unfortunately it was a casualty of the pandemic and was not able to make it through the House successfully. Um, so in the interim, the um, advocates for this bill have actually um, met with the Board of Physicians. We've helped facilitate a few of these meetings, and they've actually been fairly productive in being able to address some of the outstanding issues that were still present from the last session. Um, and we'll go over those um, briefly as well. Um, pause for Lamori to, to kind of bring this up. Yep. So Senator Lamb, I am... I have the ones, the slides for Senate Bill 68, but I do not see the ones for Senate Bill 34. Oh, just got them. You have it? Okay, great. Yeah. Ready to share it now. Okay, sounds good. So there's a bit of background for folks. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Okay, great. Uh, so you can advance to the next slide. So uh, a genetic counselor is someone who's specifically trained to assist individuals in understanding and adapting to the 
medical, psychological, and uh, familial implications of the genetic factors of disease, of various diseases. Um, those who practice genetic counseling are required to have a master's degree in genetic counseling, as well as uh, board certification examinations and continuing education requirements as mandated by the American Board of Genetic Counselors. These are the, this is the accrediting body for genetic counselors nationally. Um, they are, they do receive a large amount of um, uh, training. This includes um, areas of biology, biochemistry, genetics courses, as well as extensive training in communications and um, uh, counseling skills as well. Um, and as the fields of, of medical genetics and also genomics evolve, there's a growing need for more counselors who have the scientific background and expert communication skills to help patients navigate some really difficult decisions when it comes to inheritable diseases. And those numbers of inheritable diseases continues to grow as we um, understand more about these types of conditions and as the science um, uh, grows as well. So um, whether someone chooses to undergo testing or receive treatments based on genetic testing, um, in any case, it's a deeply personal decision and can raise questions for the patient about their health and the health of their families. Uh, counselors are needed uh, who specifically are trained to manage these complex issues and are mandated to remain current on uh, this rapidly evolving field because there are a lot of changes that take place even just in spans of years. Um, this bill will help create a pathway of licensure for these genetic counselors to fill this need and also more importantly will help create a professional accountability pathway for these individuals as well. Next slide. Um, currently over half of um, uh, states provide a pathway to um, for licensure for genetic counselors. Uh, currently there are I think more than 5,000 genetic counselors nationwide, and the demand for these genetic counselors uh, greatly exceeds supply. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, the field is expected to grow by um, some 21% over the coming decades, so the need is, is acute. Um, to address this shortage, there are 47 accredited schools in the U.S., of which two are located in Maryland, one um, at Johns Hopkins and the other at the University of Maryland at Baltimore. So it must be stressed that the establishment of um, a licensure pathway for these genetic counselors in Maryland would greatly assist in retaining uh, the talent of individuals that um, both these institutions have developed. Um, the majority of states already have established licensure pathways for genetic counselors, um, and they're usually housed in the regulatory bodies of each of the respective states' board of physicians or their equivalent body. And that's why we're looking to also have the accrediting or the licensure um, body or pathway go through the Maryland Board of Physicians as well to replicate this model. Uh, genetic counselors are, are an integral part of the medical team and, and bill through medical codes, just like most other healthcare providers. Um, their regulation, therefore, should also occur through the Board of Physicians similarly, rather than through the, we get this question often, through the Board of Professional Counselors or Therapists. Those um, licensees are typically, um, they bill differently or handle differently. Um, oftentimes, they're, you know, directly with the patient or the client, um, whereas genetic counselors are usually part of a larger practice and work very closely with the physician. Um, additionally, in our healthcare system currently, um, genetic counselors and physicians, um, you know, not only practice closely, but in many specialties as well. And this includes OB, um, GYN, and, and also oncology. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, Maria, um, establishing a, a licensure pathway will also increase access to genetic counseling service through telemedicine, which the pandemic has highlighted as an integral tool for genetic counseling. Due to the shortage of genetic counselors, Marylanders must travel to major medical centers to receive consultations, which can place burdens, particularly on those who reside in some of the more rural art areas of the state, and this includes the Eastern Shore, Western Maryland. And particularly during the pandemic, access to genetic counseling um, was further limited because of this. Uh, state and local, sorry, state and federal uh, emergency orders improved health care healthcare providers' ability to use telehealth. Um, but those orders required licensure. So, you know, there were orders that were put in place to allow for telehealth use, but they do require licensure. Genetic counselors um, don't have licensure because this pathway doesn't exist. And so they were actually forced to seek out um, out-of-state licensure in order to continue care. 
Um, so our inability to license genetic counselors is creating an ongoing patient safety and access issue here currently in Maryland. Uh, Lamar, if you go to the next slide, um, under this bill, these licensure requirements uh, will be established uh, for the profession and the practice of genetic counseling. This bill specifically requires the State Board of Physicians establish a genetic counseling advisory committee within the board that establishes regulations for the licensure and practice of genetic counseling. Um, it also establishes fees and renewal procedures for genetic counseling licensure, and it establishes penalties for noncompliance with licensure requirements. Um, as it currently stands in our current um, environment, there's no pathway to licensure. So this bill actually helps protect the public because it ensures that practitioners of genetic counseling have met the, met the minimum necessary competency standards to be able to practice. It's also important because physicians and other healthcare providers need to know that referrals for genetic counseling are being managed by an individual whose credentials have been independently verified or that they have been licensed. For patients who are provided information that may be life-changing or, or life-saving, they must be assured that their genetic counselor is licensed, responsible, and under state oversight for uh, discipline and review. Right now, anyone could, could theoretically hang a shingle out, say that they're a genetic counselor, and go about their business. Next slide. Um, so as discussed before, we've been having an ongoing discussion with the Board of Physicians on how best to license these. Uh, genetic counselors. Last year, the board provided us with seven pages of concerns, um, but we've been able to move forward together on this issue um, over a series of meetings that took place during the interim um, and just wanted to bring the committee up to speed on the work that's been done during the interim. Next slide. Uh, the board um, uh, has correctly noted in some of the earlier concerns that they expressed to us that the current bill, the one that's actually in draft that you have before you right now, calls for an even number of members of genetic counselors um, on, or even number of members on the advisory committee. And so this was actually a drafting area. We have submitted a sponsor amendment to change the structure of the advisory committee. So there are four genetic counselors, two physicians, and uh, one consumer, so that there's an odd number, um, so that they can move forward with any votes that they must take. Um, I do have some concerns about the board's proposed structure um, because it does create the, the possibility the committee could act without input from genetic counselor members, uh, which could result in the board issuing regulations without the input of someone who actually practices genetic counseling. That's why in the, in the sponsor amendment, we have um, it as four genetic counselors. Next slide, Lamoria. Um, so we agree with the board that out-of-state practice should be limited to the extent possible. There are, however, rare genetic diseases um, that have a single genetic counseling expert that may live in a different state um, because some of these conditions are very, very rare. To ensure that patients have access, I have submitted an amendment. This is modeled after the physician licensure statute um, that currently exists, which allows Maryland physicians and genetic counselors to consult with an out-of-state expert as long as the Maryland provider directs all patient care. Next slide. And the National Genetic Counseling Exam is also only offered uh, twice a year. And what this means is that most genetic counselors um, cannot take the exam right after graduation. So to ensure that Maryland has a uh, robust genetic counseling workforce, I have submitted an amendment that will allow recent graduates to practice for up to one year under supervision of a qualified genetic counselor or under the supervision of a physician. This is very similar to how other states handle this because nationally, the national exam is not offered all the time. 24 other states allow for some sort of practice after graduation. Maryland doesn't allow for practice after, if the state doesn't allow for practice after graduation, it'd be very difficult for us to retain these genetic counselors after they've been trained here. They would in all likelihood depart for somewhere else where they can practice. Um, so last year, the bill was modeled after legislation. Most other states that included a temporary license, but the board was concerned that this would be an administrative burden. I am open to other language if the board has other suggestions on this piece. Um, as, if you go to the next slide, um, the bill also includes a grandfathering clause, which will allow for highly qualified current uh, genetic counselors to be licensed without taking the exam. There's currently an ongoing evaluation of the national exam based on concerns of racial bias. This is kind of outside of this bill. But um, if we accept the board's request to remove this provision, we would run the risk of prohibiting qualified um, counselors of color from continuing to provide important services. So the grandfathering clause is in there um, and is time limited and only applies to current uh, qualified professionals. Um, without that, we could risk exacerbating current health disparities. Um, if you go to the next slide, Moria. 
the board is also asking that patients only be permitted to see genetic counselors if they've been referred by a physician. However, um, this is actually not consistent with current practice. Um, it's important to note that at the request of MedCi, the current bill text requires counselors to refer patients for diagnosis and treatment. So there is a distinction there. Anytime you need to move into diagnosis and treatment, they do need to be referred to a, a physician. But we also believe that this uh, maintains a current nexus of um, uh, how genetic counselors and physicians work together. Um, next slide, Lemuria. The board seeks to delay implementation to 2023, but um, I have some concerns about that. We believe that the risk to patients of not having access to licensed provider needs to be addressed sooner rather than later. We understand the board's concerns with COVID, um, but I think the COVID concern, as we mentioned with the telehealth issue and challenges there, also further highlighted the need for actual licensure in the state. Uh, again, open to the board's um, input on this as well. And the last slide, um, Memoria, if you can go to, there we go. In closing, um, you know, I believe that now's the time, we've, we've worked on this over the last year um, to establish a licensure pathway for these Maryland genetic counselors. Uh, in doing so, we hope to be able to protect our, our residents from the risks associated with unlicensed uh, genetic counseling practice um, and also enhance the fidelity of uh, physician referrals to genetic counselors while retaining Maryland's genetic counseling um, talent pool and increasing access to genetic counseling services um, all across the state and align Maryland um, with industry best practices as well as many other states, uh, I think 24 others who have already instituted the major, uh, these types of practices. So with that, let me close and ask the, the committee for a favorable report. Um, and I'm happy to hand it over to, I think Dr. Riker is next, is that correct? Uh, that's fine. We can go to Dr. Riker. Okay. Dr. Riker, you're on. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, committee members. Thank you, Dr. Lamb. That was a very nice overview of things. I uh, appreciate that. Um, I'm going to, I submitted two documents. I think everybody's got them. Uh, and I'm going to touch on both of them a little bit. One is a summary statement with some talking points, evidence, and data. And the other one is just a one page document about that important uh, relationship between the breast surgeon in this case, and then the, and the, genet the uh, certified genetics counselor. Uh, and that is a joint statement put forth between the two. Uh, and there's only, you know, five, four points in there and just basically states of that important relationship between uh, the American Society of Breast Surgeons, which I'm a member of, and uh, thousands of breast surgeons across the country, as well as the certified genetics counselors. Um, having said that, I've been working with certified genetics counselors for uh, 20 years. Uh, I recently came from a state uh, of Louisiana uh, where we had just gone through this entire process. Uh, they were, I was in a state where they were not licensed or recognized. Uh, and we went through the same process through the uh, House and the Senate uh, in Louisiana and were able to successfully uh, get them approved. Uh, they are formally licensed now. And I might add, uh, with the support of the Board of Physicians in Louisiana, uh, as opposed to this, uh, where they are opposed. Um, and also without amendments, by the way. So there are 29 states, uh, I think 27, 28, 29 states that have done this. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. Uh, certified genetics counselors are a really important part of my clinical practice and many other physicians across this country. I can tell you uh, with great certainty that I am not the expert. We're us so-called physicians, those cancer physicians. I'm a surgical oncologist. I'm not the expert on, on uh, ordering the right test for, for my patient who's at high risk for the development of, uh, of uh, hereditary breast cancer. In fact, I'm not gonna go through all these talking points. We on average, the physician who is, uh, has the responsibility of ordering this test orders the wrong panel or the wrong test in over half the time. That's half the time we are ordering the wrong test. So please don't come away from this thinking that the physicians know better than somebody who has gone through school and training and is a professional and does this all day long, every day to take care of these patients at high risk. So 
I really and truly depend on my certified genetics counselors in order to have the counseling, which lasts, you know, a good hour to sit there and talk to the patients about their genetic risk, ordering the test, and then having the post-test results and have that counseling session. If I did that in my practice all day long, I wouldn't even be able to see any of the new cancer patients because of the great need uh, for uh, genetic counseling. Furthermore, there's a nationwide shortage for genetics counselors. We don't have enough of them. And to Dr. Lamb's point of, uh, we have two schools here for genetic counselors. They're not looking for jobs in this state. Why? Because it's hard to hire them because I've got to, for this institute, we've got to eat the cost of hiring a genetics counselor because number one, they're not recognized. And number two, I'm unable to bill for their services as a result of that. And so we have to eat the cost and we do that because it's the right thing to do for our patients uh, with cancer. Um, some of the other talking points, there is a lot of wasted money out there. So if I order the wrong test, I get the wrong results back. And then there's further uh, issue when a surgeon is looking at the test results and makes a clinical decision that is incorrect. And I would point to one thing. One of the test results that you get when you order this genetic test or a panel is what's called a VUS, V as in Victor US, a variant of unknown clinical significance. And so you get these test results back and it shows a VUS, which is not actionable. We should not be operating on a patient with a VUS. We shouldn't be doing any clinical decision-making. However, that's not the case. Many patients end up going to the operating room and receiving unnecessary surgery based on an incorrect interpretation of a VUS. Let that sink in. Dr. We Reichert, you're gonna to have to close. Okay, sorry. Uh, so I'll finish uh, with greatly needed. They are professionals. They need to be recognized and they need to be formally licensed. Thank you. Um, we're gonna to go to um, Carolyn Applegate and we have uh, four witnesses in favor three selected and one randomly from the list, then we'll take questions. Uh, um, Ms. or Dr. Applegate. Thank you. Um, Chair Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, and committee members, thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts on Senate Bill 34. My name is Carolyn Applegate, and I'm here representing Johns Hopkins University as the genetic counseling manager, as well as all of my colleagues in Maryland. First, I would like to thank the committee for your favorable vote last session. And as Dr. Lamb said, since then we've been meeting with the Board of Physicians. And I wanna highlight one amendment in particular that I would like to address on behalf of my colleagues. The board is asking to strike language that waives that one year um, or waives licensure for one year after graduation from accredited program. We feel it's absolutely imperative that new graduates are able to practice immediately following graduation. Demonstration of competency to practice independently is a graduation requirement. There is already a shortage of genetic counselors, so it's necessary to allow these new graduates to practice. And as it's been said, Maryland is home to two nationally recognized graduate programs of excellence. Our neighboring states have temporary licenses, so a waiver or a temporary license is necessary to attract and retain the best graduates so that we can expand the availability of genetic counseling services to Marylanders. As you all know, a major purpose of this, light, of this bill is to protect the public. And the COVID-19 pandemic led to telemedicine waivers. And so Maryland genetic counselors did be begin providing telemedicine consultations successfully. And we found that we did reach more patients on the west, on, in Western Maryland and the Eastern shore. Um, but the lack of licensure left consumers vulnerable to receive services from individuals that don't meet the minimum education requirements defined by this bill. And so this bill ensures accountability of providers by adding an investigative process of complaint and disciplinary action, ensuring that the consumers receiving medical care in Maryland receive the same quality of care that they would in neighboring states. It's time that Maryland, home to some of the greatest genetics research and clinical care in the world, have statutes in place to permit genetic counselors to provide services to the thousands of patients that need them. 
This is a priority for Johns Hopkins University Hospital and we've submitted written testimony. We urge a favorable report on Senate Bill 34 and I thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Applegate. Um, let's go to Lisa Schlager. Please unmute. Great, thank you. Um, good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to comment on Senate Bill 34. Uh, as you shared, I'm Lisa Schlager. I'm the Vice President of Public Policy for FORCE. Um, we're a national nonprofit that advocates for people facing hereditary cancers. I'm speaking on behalf of our organization nationally, as well as our Maryland constituents, including myself, as I carry a BRCA1 genetic mutation. Like me, the majority of our members carry inherited mutations that significantly increase their risk of cancer um, and that's a heavy, a heavy burden. Access to knowledgeable professionals with experience in genetics is crucial in helping those with genetic, uh, faced with genetic testing make informed medical decisions. As such, we strongly support the commitment to ensuring that Maryland residents have access to high quality care achieved through genetic counselor licensure. Genetics is rapidly growing in a complex field that affects virtually every facet of medicine. Quality genetic counseling services are vital as more consumers base healthcare decisions such as increased screening, risk-reducing surgeries, or even family building choices on their genetic test results. Most healthcare providers have little or no training in genetics. Genetic counselors, however, have advanced degrees and advanced knowledge in genetics and counseling. They are uniquely trained to provide just this information, education, advocacy, and emotional support for medical conditions that have genetic indications. They often work in tandem with the oncologists, the surgeons, internists, and other healthcare practitioners to provide the full spectrum of personalized care. With the expansion of genetic testing, we have seen an increase in fraudulent genetic counseling and testing services, often targeting our most vulnerable citizens. In recent years, FORCE has filed complaints against several companies and individuals for unscrupulous behavior. In the majority of these cases, those providing genetic counseling had little, little or no training in genetics, and most had absolutely no healthcare background. Inappropriate genetic testing or misinterpretation of results can lead to serious adverse outcomes for patients and their families. Research shows that genetic counselor licensure also serves to save the health system money. Genetic tests and the associated services are costly. Nearly a quarter of all genetic tests are ordered incorrectly by clinicians who don't have sufficient knowledge of genetic testing. And this includes orders of unwarranted, cost ineffective, duplicate or entirely unnecessary tests. Licensed genetic counselors have the expertise to guide appropriate patient assessment and ordering of these tests, thereby minimizing wasteful spending and combat combating healthcare fraud and abuse. National guidelines recommend genetic counseling before and after testing. As you Ms. know- Ms. Schleiger, you're gonna have to yeah. wrap up, please. Okay. Uh, licensure is an important mechanism to help consumers and practitioners identify appropriately uh, trained professionals. And in summary, we strongly support this legislation and urge you to endorse licensure of genetic counselors. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And finally, uh, John Richardson. Yes, hello, uh, Chairman Penske, Vice Chair Kagan and distinguished members. Uh, I'm John Richardson, Director of Government Relations for the National Society of Genetic Counselors. I'm also a resident of Edgewater, Maryland. Um, I really want to thank Senator Lamb for all his work on introducing SB 34, um, an important bill that will license genetic counselors. Um, as Director of Government Relations for NSGC, I've worked on 27 of the 29 licensure laws in the United States. Um, and I can uh, say emphatically that SB 34 is consistent in its requirements with the other states, including our, ne our nearest neighbors, which are Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Virginia, that all have licensure for genetic counselors. I've submitted written testimony, um, which I hope you all will review. Um, I did want to address one issue uh, in that um, I know Senator Lamb and some others may have received a letter from um, the American College of Medical uh, Genetics. Um, they represent geneticists in the country. There are about five or 600 of them practicing in clinics. 
Um, and they're opposing this bill unless an amendment is added that will require a collaborative agreement between a, a patient's physician and a genetic counselor. Also that physicians would have to co-sign co test orders done by a genetic counselor. Um, I wanna make it clear that ACMG does not speak for genetic counselors um, and, and we oppose what they're, what they're attempting to do. Um, it's, it's, it's really paternalistic in nature. It speaks to a throwback in time. Um, it would create an unworkable delivery of care model that Maryland physicians don't want. Um, it would also create needless paperwork, ensure wasted time between physicians and genetic counselors as they would need to talk through the agreement, create a need for legal review, and I could go on and on. Requiring that test orders be co-signed would also create a system of wasted time and delay in testing without any real benefit to the patient. As was said, genetic counselors really know this stuff and can order the right test for the right person at the right time. I believe their position would actually reduce collaboration. We wanna make it easier for those physicians that don't have the genetics training to be able to identify qualified genetic counselors and refer their patients to them to ensure high quality of care. Um, we believe that uh, their current position would set genetic counselors back at least a de decade and um, create more barriers. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. Thank support. you very much. Yep, we hope you will support and yep. um, happy to answer any questions. Okay, uh, committee members, we have one favorable with amendment and no uh, oral opposition. There is one person who has written, submitted written testimony. Let's take the one favorable with amendments and then we'll just open it up to questions. Again, I've got 20 people signed up favorable or favorable with amendments and one written opposition. So uh, Matthew Dud Dudzik. Are you here? Uh, yes, I'm here. Please, sir. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, uh, members of the committee. Uh, Matthew Dudzik with the Maryland Board of Physicians. Uh, as I'm, I'm sure you recall, the board testified in opposition to this bill last year. Uh, since then, we have met with the stakeholders. We've found several areas of agreement. Um, that said, there are still a couple of core issues that need to be resolved before the board can support this legislation. Um, I do, since it, it was brought up a few times, I do really want to touch on the um, licensure exemption for recent graduates. Um, that licensure exemption would actively make the board's mission difficult to enforce. Um, it, there is no other allied health practitioner with any similar exemption, and with good reason. I mean, this would allow individuals who would otherwise be completely ineligible for licensure to practice for a full year without ever having a criminal history records check done, ever verifying their education or certification requirements, uh, or going through any of the other safeguards that exist to protect Maryland patients. Um, I understand that um, you know, this is very important to um, the, um, the proponents of this bill because of the timing of the examination. Um, I will also say that this is not a problem that is solely limited to genetic counselors. Um, I believe that if we added this, we would also see other allied health practitioners uh, lobbying for a similar exemption. Um, and it, it creates a, a very difficult position for the board um, because the board cannot perform any of, the, um, any of the safeguards that happen during the licensure process. Um, we did bring up some other consistency issues. You, you can find those in our position paper, um, such as the, the makeup of the advisory committee. In the interest of time, I will, of course, simply urge you to, to review that paper. Uh, I did want to touch on one last point, though. Um, as you might imagine, COVID has created some major uncertainties for the board. Uh, we are currently responsible for licensing and regulating over 45,000 active health practitioners who are on the front lines of this pandemic. Um, our focus has been and must continue to be on maintaining essential operations. Uh, again, I, I would direct you to our position paper and also the fiscal and policy note for more detail. Um, but um, for that reason, we do believe that it would be unfeasible, uh, that it would not be feasible to have this bill go into effect, you know, October of this year. Uh, we would urge the committee to consider delaying the implementation. Uh, the bill does not require uh, licensure uh, as written until October 1st of 2023 regardless. Um, so this um, being able to push back that start date allows us to uh, focus our priorities on maintaining essential operations. Uh, thank you for the time. Uh, I would just close by urging the committee to submit a favorable report with the uh, Board of Physicians amendments. 
um, uh, committee uh, questions for any of the uh, panelists uh, testifiers. Mr. Chairman, I have a quick question for the board. Sure. So, um, you know, I think we, we do agree that there should be a background check, um, but we also want to balance that against the fact that if, if there's no way to temporarily allow them to practice um, after they've completed their training, they're just going to leave the state. Um, and so I think that's why we were asking if they could practice under the supervision of another gen genetic counselor or another physician as well. Um, and they could go through that kind of a background check too, you know, as part of a temporary license, so to speak. Is that something, is a temporary license then something the board would support to have that background check? Certainly. Uh, the issue from, from an administrative perspective, the issue with temporary licensure is that it would be the creation of an entirely new licensure category that doesn't, that the board is not currently set up to, to administer. Um, it's something that, I, I mean, it, at a bare minimum, it would require us to revise our fiscal note upward uh, in, order to, uh, in order to properly deal with that. Um, it, the problem with uh, simply allowing for the licensure exemption, I mean, certainly, you know, we understand the concerns, um, but it takes the, that verification process out of the hands of the board and puts it into the hands of the supervising physician or supervising genetic counselor. Um, and once again, you know, th there are other professions that have similar uh, issues with the timing of their examination. But, you know, certainly, but, we would support okay. lobbying for the exam to okay. be administered. But to that last point, yeah. Mr. Dusik, the right now they are practicing without any supervision anyway because they, they're unlicensed. And so I understand your, your concern with that last point, but right now they can do what they're doing anyway without anyone overseeing what they're doing. Well, certainly. Um, and... Um, you know, I would just say that, you know, the, the purpose of this bill is to um, create licensure and to create a requirement that uh, these services cannot be provided uh, without licensure. Uh, if you are creating that requirement, the board simply feels that building in exemptions to that requirement defeats the purpose of, um, of licensure and, and of regulating this profession. Well, I'm open to your ideas on how to solve the recent graduate problem. So okay. hope we continue that. Uh, seeing no further questions, uh, this concludes the hearing on um, uh, Senator Lamb's bill. We're going to move to Senator Augustine, uh, Senate Bill 82. Um, it'll be Senator Augustine. This is Professional Counselor and Therapist, Music Therapist Act. Um, and there is no opposition. There are some uh, favorable amendment. After Senator Augustine, we'll hear from uh, Kimberly uh, Senator Moore, uh, then favorable with amendments, uh, Candace Robinson and Nikki Run. Uh, Senator Augustine, welcome. Thank you, Chair Penske, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of the committee. Uh, this is Senator Malcolm Augustine. I'm here to present Senate Bill 82 with the sponsor amendment that you should uh, find uh, within the written testimony. This aims to extend state recognition through certification um, to board certified music therapists on the audiology, hearing aid dispensers, and speech, speech language pathologist board. Colleagues, I presented the case for state board licensure uh, recognition for music therapists and its efficacy as a treatment last session, as this bill was originally drafted within the state board of professional counselors and therapists. Please know that the advocates who you will hear from on the sponsor panel work diligently during the interim to find the appropriate board. I want to thank Kim Link, who is now a uh, boards and commissions liaison, but who was previously executive director of the Board of Professional Counselors and Therapists, who helped facilitate and participated in many of this, the discussions this interim. I'm happy to report that we have come to agreement with the Board of Audiology, Hearing Aid Dispensers, and Speech Language Pathologists and they join us on the sponsors panel. The essence of the bill is that we move music therapists into the board and add two, two music therapists to the board to assist with adjudication. I was originally attracted to this bill because I wanted to improve access to healthcare, particularly behavioral health. And I like to focus on ways to improve that access from the perspective that I know best and that is as a consumer and a parent. I go and I search for music therapists using a Google search 
Right now, what I find is individuals like marriage counselors, social workers, all different kinds of folks trying to find a state recognized music therapist and seeing that they are not listed uh, you know, you can just find all these different kinds of licensed clinical professionals, but we can't be assured that we will have a Maryland State certified music therapist. That's what that's a problem that this bill uh, looks to fix and to clearly delineate uh, who is a Maryland State certified music therapist. The challenge uh, that we currently face is that there is no legitimate way to identify music ther ther therapists because they are not included on the licensure. Um, 13 states have already implemented this, and again, this goal is to expand access and quality assur assurance of this evidence-based treatment. There's no questions here on the benefits music therapy is capable of bringing to people's lives. Now we do want to recognize music therapists, and music therapists brought in to address the needs of people with a wide variety of mental health disorders, autism disorders, dementia, schizophrenia, depression, but they're also brought in for medical conditions like cancer and strokes. This bill will provide the state recognition and we assure that there are um, that they are saying that they are practicing music therapists and are in fact Maryland State Board certified. Colleagues, I ask for your favorable um, report on this. I would also note that with the amendment, um, it should relieve any concern that the uh, the board uh, of of clinical professional counselors of Maryland would have because it's now going to go into audiology. I would also say that the fiscal note references the, um, the previous language and that with the amended language, I do believe that is my understanding that the audiology hearing dispensers and spe speech pathology language pathologist board would be able to accommodate the music therapist with their existing resources. Colleagues, uh, for these reasons, I ask for a favorable report on Senate Bill 82 as amended. And Chair Pensky, uh, Ms. Nikki Rungi, if it's okay with you, is actually my lead proponent. That's fine. Ms. Rungi? Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Vice Chair. My name is Nikki Rungi, and I'm a board certified music therapist. I'm also the co chair for the Maryland Music Therapy State Task Force for Occupational Regulation and the Government Relations Chair for the Maryland Association for Music Therapy. I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to be heard again on behalf of our clients and the music therapists in Maryland. Our goal has always been and continues to be to increase access to music therapy services and assure that these services are provided by qualified professionals who have completed the education, clinical training, and continuing education required of board certified music therapists. I wanted to take the time today just for a little bit to um, highlight the COVID-19 response from Maryland music therapists. Um, a national COVID-19 survey was conducted in 2020 and found that two thirds of music therapists in Maryland who responded were considered essential workers. Music therapists continued to serve Maryland's most vulnerable citizens through the continuation of in-person sessions and also through telehealth. Music therapists across the state were able to safely adapt in the moment to continue to provide services based on client needs and the current level of COVID restrictions. Sessions were conducted through telehealth via pre-recorded videos, live videos, and audio sessions, as well as continued in-person sessions involving outdoor and window visits. As we continue through the pandemic, without a state license, these frontline workers were not eligible, all of us were not eligible for the phase one distribution of the COVID vaccine with related healthcare professionals. And are still some need to wait until the general public receives them, even though they are still working with our vulnerable populations. So this does put our population, uh, our clients at risk. So we are working with the Board of Audiologists, Hearing Aid Dispensers and Speech Language Pathologists, and we ask that the committee approve um, Senate Bill 82 with amendments that were requested, um, suggested by the board. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Rungi. Um, let's go to Ms. Moore. Good afternoon, Chair Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of the Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about Senate Bill 82. My name is Dr. Kimberly Senna Moore, and I am the Regulatory Affairs Associate for the Certification Board for Music Therapists, the credentialing organization for music therapists in the United States. 
I'm speaking here on behalf of the National Government Relations Team from uh, CBMT and the American Music Therapy Association. It is our pleasure to support this le legislation, which creates a music therapy license and as such, helps remove barriers to music therapy services by qualified uh, professionals in the state of Maryland. Officially recognizing music therapy through state licensure serves a public protection function as it ensures not only that uh, those who are qualified as, uh, wow, well, ensures that only those who are qualified as professional music therapists, and that's those who hold the requisite education and clinical training requirements, provide music therapy services. This limits the potential for harm to citizens. Additionally, this license would create channels for consumers to more easily access music therapy services while also allowing employers potential employers and private citizens to feel confident in the training and education of the music therapists they employ to work with their loved ones. Despite the numerous health, economic, and social challenges of the previous year, music therapy remains an essential service for clients, family members, and healthcare providers as they navigate myriad challenges. Since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, Music therapists have adapted the delivery of their services and diversified service options to meet emerging needs of clients, family members, and healthcare providers. In addition, music therapy interventions are frequently considered when identifying potential pandemic-related treatment and support services for consumers and healthcare professionals. Last June, we disseminated a national survey to music therapists to gather information about how the pandemic has impacted their work. Almost two thirds of respondents, including many in Maryland, as you heard Nikki mentioned, indicated they added telepractice as a service delivery option. And the vast majority of the telepractice uh, options are live virtual music therapy sessions. This has not only allowed for continuity of services, it has also enhanced therapeutic outcomes and allowed families to be more involved so they can witness the work and change and progress that occurs when their loved ones are engaged in music therapy. And perhaps surprisingly, since we are facilitating music experiences through video tel uh, conferencing like Zoom, the majority of survey respondents, almost 75%, agree Dr. that Moore, they're- Dr. Moore, yes, you're gonna have to conclude. Will do, that their clients are responding positively to telepractice music therapy services and in fact, some are thriving in ways that didn't happen when seen in person. Thank you. So thank, thank you. you for your consideration. Okay. Um, let's go to Candace Robinson, please. And we'll take questions. Is Ms. Robinson on the- Chair, Vice Chair and Committee. Thank you for letting me speak. My name is Candace Robinson. I am the Executive Director of the Board of Audiologists hearing aid dispensers and speech language pathologists. And I'm also a doctor of audiology by profession. Um, it is the position of our board that music correlates well with the current audiology and speech language pathology professions we regulate. Particularly music can be used to help those with various brain injuries and disorders that affect sensory and motor skills. Examples of these disorders include patients with Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, stroke and autism all patients whom speech language pathologists serve as well. Music can also be used with patients suffering from tinnitus. Tinnitus is the perception of sound in the absence of an external sound or stimulus, and it has been shown to provide a perception of relief of tinnitus when patients listen to preferred music. For these reasons, the board supports having the profession of music therapists join and be regulated by our board with the requested amendments. As Senator Augustine has mentioned um, at the time of this bill, um, the amendments had not been made yet. Um, one of the amendments that uh, we requested was to have uh, two seats on our board's composition. Um, and uh, by having the two seats, um, we feel that the board um, would be able to go ahead and adopt regulations, codes of ethics and continuing education uh, because music therapists would have voices and be able to vote on the board. Uh, one of the other amendments was that um, we do not feel that an additional physician needs to sit on the composition of the board. We currently have two physicians who specialize in ear, nose, and throat disorders and have the expertise um, already sitting on the board composition. Uh, and finally, uh, again, instead, uh, we would 
have two seats on the board. Um, so uh, we would not need to have a separate committee. Therefore, there would be no true fiscal um, impact or um, on, our, on our staff to um, bring the music therapist on. So we respectfully um, ask for a favorable report. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for any of the panelists? Uh, I've got one while uh, we're waiting on other questions. Is it my understanding in the bill, and again, I just need a simple answer, that while we've added putting them under the audiologist board, that language still is included in the bill that has the uh, American Association as the first hurdle before they're even considered by the audiology board. In other words, on page three, it says board certified means an individual who completed the education and training established by the American Association and then holds current board certification from the certified board for music therapists. So while you've added a local board in the state, the first group that vets it is actually the national group and not the audiologist board. Is that correct or not correct? Yes, so we would require that they hold that certification in order to be licensed. Okay, and secondly, how many people are practicing musical therapy in the state? There's approximately 140 currently. And the final question, how many complaints have arisen of people who are advertising themselves as musical therapists when they in fact haven't completed the necessary work? I, I would not have that information because we're not currently regulating them. Right. And then the point of this is to regulate them as they are not. I, I understand, but I don't know if people have complained to the national organization or to another body like physicians or whatever. Um, is there a record of complaints of people misrepresenting themselves? Are there any other members of this panel that could answer those questions? Or perhaps a certi certifying board? And Hello, not, this is Kimberly Sanamore. Yeah. And, and yes, we do um, both uh, the American Music Therapy Association and the Certification Board for Music Therapists field complaints uh, from uh, you regarding individuals who maybe rep uh, misrepresent their services. But as uh, Candace mentioned, there really is no legal mechanism to um, enforce, you know, or, or really appropriately handle those types of, of complaints. So they do okay. happen, yes. Well, if, if you can let me know how many verified complaints, even if they weren't proven, mm -hmm. um, your office has received uh, these are the uh, Maryland people practicing uh, through misrepresentation in the state. Yes, we will get that information to you. Uh, further questions? Further questions? Seeing none, that concludes the hearing on Senator Augustine's bill. Thank you, Senator and witnesses. We're going to go back to Senator Eckert from the mid-shore to Thank you. Senate Bill 13. Um, we have uh, Lee to Senator Eckert, and then she'll be followed in one of the orders, and that's up to you, Senator. Um, Karen Evans, Rhonda Scott, Walter Miro, and um, I don't believe there's any opposition to the bill, either oral or written more amendments. So uh, Senator Eckert, you're up. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chair and members of the um, Education, Health and Environmental Affairs Committee. I'm here today with a very important bill that will expedite getting certified nursing assistants into the workforce. Um, this bill actually authorizes CNA to renew her certificate um, if she had not completed those he or she had not completed those 16 hours of required active practice within a two-year period preceding the renewal. This would then allow a refresher course that would be determined and worked out with the Board of Nursing 
Um, so there would be an expedited process to be able to allow those CNAs to successfully recertify and then enter the workforce. This came as, to me as a, an issue, as you know, we've had a shortage of CNAs in our long-term care facilities for a long time, and many of our community colleges are working to um, provide that education and training for the CNAs, but then needed to get them back into the workforce. So many of the agencies, facilities around the state, together with the community college, together with the Board of Nursing, worked out an agreement. And this is the result of that agreement to be able to allow the Board of Nursing to develop those refresher programs so that we can get those CNAs, GNAs, uh, credentialed and into the workforce. There are some federal guidelines that have to be met, so we can't bypass those, but the Board of Nursing believes they can work this out. Um, I believe Karen Evans from the Board of Nursing may not be here. Rhonda will be here, but I urge your favorable consideration, ultimate passage of this very important piece of legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, and thank you for your patience. Uh, let's go to uh, Ms. Scott. You're right, Ms. Evans is not on the call. Ms. Scott, followed by Eric. Yes. Good afternoon, Chair Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to Senate Bill 13 today. My name is Rhonda Scott, and I am the Deputy Director as well as the Director of Enforcement for the Maryland Board of Nursing. There has been a great need for creating CNA refresher courses in Maryland for a while, as uh, Senator Eckert has stated. And um, we've heard from the stakeholders in the community and you know, CNA training programs, employers, as well as legislators about this need. The overall goal and purpose of this legislation is to, to decrease the burden on the direct caregiver in re-entering the workforce. And the reality of the COVID pandemic hit us hard in realizing that this you know, is something that we can do to help mobilize the workforce. Um, we're lessening the cost, lessening the time that it would take for these direct caregivers to re-enter. We get, um, many of our constituents are reaching out wanting to um, come back to the workforce to assist with the COVID pandemic. And this is just one way to assist them in um, you know, aiding uh, during this time uh, without having that burden of then uh, completing a, a whole four to six week program um, where it could be less into possibly as short as one week. Um, the board is all quite prepared to, you know, we wouldn't be starting from scratch. We already have curriculum for CNA training programs. We have a CNA advisory committee that um, we will task to determine what are the uh, critical elements that would be needed, needed to be included in the refresher course. So we would not be building new curriculum in essence. Um, so this is something that we, we strongly would um, urge a favorable report from the committee uh, for those reasons to assist uh, with these caregivers entering re-entering the workforce. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, Eric Coulter Miro, please, from Alzheimer's Association. Chair Pinsky and Vice Chair Kagan, thank you for your leadership of this committee and your advocacy for the nonprofit community in Maryland. My name is Eric Colchmiro, and I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Alzheimer's Association in Maryland. I'm here today uh, in strong support of SB 13. Our organization sincerely applauds Senator Eckert for her ongoing focus on the healthcare workforce. We are, along with Senator Eckert, active members of the Oversight Committee for the Quality of Care in Nursing Homes and Assisted Living Facilities. In the Oversight Committee's 2020 annual report, Senator Eckert's insights were instrumental in the committee's recommendation that there is an opportunity for the Maryland Board of Nursing to work with the long-term care industry on measures such as expedited credentialing of entry-level staff for safe practice to allow for a greater number of individuals to receive CNA and GNA training. As Senator Eckert has rightly testified, there is a shortage of nurses. A University of Maryland 2018 working group estimated that at over 10,000 by 2025. For Alzheimer's and dementia patients who often live in nursing homes and assisted living facilities, getting more and qualified nurses has been especially critical during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Yet the COVID crisis has heightened a recruitment, retention, and training problem that existed long before the pandemic. Staff work in multiple long-term care facilities and facilities including memory care units, which treat the most vulnerable patients with Alzheimer's and dementia, need to have the staff to get better care. We need to implement cost-effective strategies as SB 13 suggests to sustain both the quantity and the quality of this vital workforce. We applaud Senator Eckert for this legislation and urge a favorable report. Uh, thank you all panelists. Any questions for any of the panelists? As I noted, there is no opposition. Seeing no questions, uh, that concludes the hearing. Thank you, Senator Eckert, for your patience. You. We're going to go to uh, Senator Young, uh, SB 84. <clears throat> Senator Young will be followed by, um, hold on. Uh, be followed in some order by uh, Aaliyah Horton, um, Dr. Uh, uh, Eret, and um, Richard DiBenedetto and uh, Kelly Locklear. Senator Young. And, um, uh, thank you, Mr. And let me note, um, the only unfavorable is written, it is not oral, and uh, I don't see any favorable with amendments. Please, Senator Young, welcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Good to be back again. Um, this bill passed the uh, House um, unanimously last year and got caught up in the tail end of uh, the mess we were in with uh, COVID. So it did not uh, move on our side. Uh, basically, there's a need for increased access to medication administration services for many types of medications, such as those used in, um, to treat uh, osteoporosis, uh, specialty medications, and supplements that have to be provided by a healthcare professional. Additionally, there are a variety of self-administered injection uh, medications that patients or caregivers are expected to administer at home. In a lot of cases, due to uh, dexterity, deficiencies, fear of needles, age, other challenges, there's a need for a highly accessible healthcare provider uh, to provide the medication administration services for the patient. Without uh, access to alternatives, many patients who are unable to self-administer may not take their medications at all. And this bill seeks to provide such an alternative. The bill also addresses challenges faced in the administration of medication, challenges including scheduling, crowded waiting rooms and doctor's offices and limited personnel and, and clinics to administer medications, as well as the cost of maintaining the uh, necessary inventory. Uh, pharma uh, pharmacists are in a unique position, unique position to address these challenges. I get my flu shots at a pharmacy on a regular basis. I've gotten my pneumonia shots at a pharmacy. I've gotten my shingle shots at a pharmacy. It's very convenient, uh, less than three minutes from my house. And in many locations, uh, pharmacies are much uh, more accessible than, than getting an appointment with a doctor or a clinic. Uh, I had a personal situation many years ago, which required me to change doctors. I had the flu very badly and wanted some medication and they told me they couldn't give it to me without the doctor's approval. So I asked to see the doctor and the earliest, uh, they said he could see me was two months later. I figured I'd either be well or dead by then. So I switched to another doctor and got help that uh, day. But then uh, after that, got my shots at, uh, um, at a pharmacy. Uh, Senate Bill 545 would require that the Board of Pharmacy develop regulations in consultation with the Board of Physicians and the Board of Nursing. And it would require training on medications Notifi uh, notification to the prescriber that the medication was administered or not to the patient uh, would be forwarded uh, to the doctor. 
Now this bill requires that uh, a doctor uh, prescribe this and then allows the uh, pharmacy to uh, administer it after that and, and keep it in touch with uh, the pharmacy. This bill would have been very helpful this past year had it had it passed. Many psychologists, psychiatrists do not like to administer these uh, medications and had pharmacies been able to, it would have been a great help. Uh, the governor, I think by executive order, has already allowed the pharmacies to uh, do the COVID injections. So these pharmacists are highly trained and are in a very good position for convenience and uh, ability to, uh, to do this. So we're hoping this year that we can get a uh, favorable report and uh, allow pharmacies to begin this. Thank you, Senator Young. Uh, before I go to the uh, other proponents, if I wasn't clear, I, I said there was no opponent with oral testimony. The yeah. uh, record showed two written testimony, one um, representative of Maryland Right to Life and another from the Maryland Department of Health. Although in the file, the only thing is from the Department of Health is about sexually transmitted diseases. So um, I haven't found their testimony yet. So hopefully over time we will find it. Okay, with that being said. Um, Chairman, can I ask the sponsor one question? Right, let's, let's wait. Wait, okay. okay. Uh, Senator Young, who do you want to go first? Um, I think uh, 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 just take, uh, take him and okay. what do you have? Uh, uh, Aaliyah Horton from Aaliyah, the pharmacy, Aaliyah should go first, yes. From the uh, Pharmacists Association. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aaliyah Horton. I am the executive director of the Maryland Pharmacists Association. It's nice to see you all and um, happy new year. Uh, glad to be back into session. So SB 84 is a priority bill of MPHA. And so obviously we are, urge a favorable report. As the Senator mentioned, a previous iteration of this bill was unanimously passed by the House of Delegates in 2020. And just for a little history, when this bill was introduced, uh, originally introduced, it had a much broader scope and it has been substantially modified since its original in introduction in 2019. And that was really to address the concerns of members of this committee, as well as stakeholders in both the provider and patient advocacy communities. And we have reached to work consensus or um, consensus may be a strong word, maybe a truce on um, where we are with this bill as introduced. And so um, we negotiated with about 15 different entities to get to this point. And with that, um, the specific conditions that would be allowed for pharmacists to administer medications under this bill would be psychiatric conditions, substance abuse, contraception, and um, vitamin deficiency. So this would allow pharmacists to fill a gap in providing a service to patients near their homes um, that's more accessible. We've also removed um, biologics from the legislation and this bill requires that prescribers administer the first dose unless they specifically or explicitly indicate otherwise. Um, so that's kind of the basics. We've you know, been through to this committee several times with this legislation. So that's the, those are the consensus areas that we got to. Um, my understanding um, regarding the Maryland Insurance Administration may have introduced um, amendments to you all. If not, they have in the House side and they are technical amendments that we have agreed to and we're gonna finalize those in the subcommittee on the House side tomorrow. Um, in terms of the Maryland Right to Life group, um, the use of the term maintenance means um, the medications referenced in their opposition are not included in the scope of this bill. And um, they primarily reference oral medications, which also are not in the scope of this bill. Um, Mifepristone, Secondol, and Phenobarbital are taken orally. They're not injections. 
and the FDA already has restrictions on mifeprestone. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. And it's prohibited from being dispensed by pharmacists in pharmacies. And so I believe there may be a misunderstanding about the, the scope and context of this legislation um, in reference to that group. Um, at this point, I'll just defer any questions related to on the ground implementation and specific medications to the pharmacists that are um, testifying today. And then I'm happy to answer any questions related to the work that got us here and what we need to do to get it passed. Um, I will mention that Dr. De Benedetto. I don't believe he's on the call. We got two different um, notices about whether we could testify or not, and he changed his schedule. So I believe he has written testimony that was submitted for the record. And so I please ask you to um, review his comments. Thank you, uh, Ms. Horton. Thank you very much. Then we'll go to uh, Megan uh, Eret with the pharmacy group. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, chairman and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity. I'm Dr. Megan Eret. I've been a psychiatric pharmacist for over 15 years. Currently an associate professor at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy and a past president of the College of Psychiatric and Neurologic Pharmacists. Thank you, Senator Young, for introducing this bill again. This is my third year here testifying on behalf of this bill. While we've waited and discussed all the components of the bill, I have unfortunately watched numerous patients suffer without medication and be readmitted to the hospital unnecessarily. Across the country, at least 44 states have allowed pharmacists to administer these medications in some form or another, and pharmacists have continued to demonstrate the value and need for this service. During the recent pandemic, the University of Maryland has had to create unique ways to administer these injections when psychiatrists and other professionals went to telehealth. We arranged, unfortunately, for patients to come to the ER to receive these maintenance injections because there was nowhere else to receive them. The time, money, and resources spent to arrange okay. for these injections was foolish. Additionally, we were putting staff, um, pulling them from emergency response, potentially exposing patients to COVID in the ER, and allowing for so many potential mistakes and problems. Think about how easy it would have been for me to send them to the community pharmacy to administer the medication. The bill will keep the prescriber intact. The pharmacist is not prescribing the medication, they're only administering it. The pharmacist has been trained in administration and monitoring. Additionally, there will be requirements um, by existing regulations to complete continuing education on administration every time they renew their license. The pharmacist will follow up with the prescriber to document the administration, any adverse effects and symptoms noted at administration. Pharmacists will continue to increase access to necessary medications for a vulnerable population in desperate need of additional care. Senate Bill 84 presents an opportunity for the state of Maryland to improve access to care, extend to the public health role of trained pharmacists, and improve interdisciplinary cooperation. I ask for a favorable report on House or Senate Bill 84. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eret. Uh, let's get a, a Kelly Locklear. Good afternoon, honorable members of the committee. For the record, my name is Kaylee Locklear here on behalf of the Maryland Chain Drug Store Association. We firmly support this legislation and would point out to you all that more than half the states in the United States have existing laws already permitting pharmacists to administer injectables. The access that our over 1,200 pharmacies in the state provide coupled with the training and experience our pharmacists have in drug administration techniques and practices will enhance the delivery of healthcare here in Maryland. Uh, as you heard earlier, the bill passed unanimously by the House of Delegates um, and we would urge an, a favorable report on this legislation. I'm glad to answer any questions the committee has. Thank you. I'll go back to uh, Senator Lamb just a second. Apparently the Board of Nursing under the Department of Health um, does oppose it and there is written testimony. Hopefully you have it. If not, we can get copies to the committee. Uh, that being said, Senator Lamb, you have a question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is just a quick question for the sponsor. So I've been contacted by um, a few infectious disease physicians and clinicians um, who have submitted also uh, written testimony about the possibility of an amendment that would just clarify that this bill also covers sexually transmitted diseases and infections in order to help address the growing um, STD rates in Maryland. Um, so really just clarifying this for STIs, STDs. Um, to the sponsor, would you be open to discussing language to make this clarification? 
Um, I'll let the experts speak on this, but uh, I did read your amendment. I don't see a problem with the amendment in terms of pharmacists being able to inject. The only concern we have is that we feel it's really important to get this bill through. We don't want it to, to go back or have adding this cause the bill not to, to pass. I think if it, if it can move uh, smoothly as part of the bill, that, that wouldn't be a problem. But uh, we just don't want to lose the bill again this year. And I agree. And I don't want to derail the bill because I want this to, to not continue to be on the, the committee's agenda too. So, you know, I think if there's some way to, to figure this out and work it out, we're, we're certainly open to that. I just don't want to, you know, move too quickly if there's a, an easy policy solution here to, to a problem that some of these infectious disease um, providers have brought up. Well, I'll let uh, Aaliyah speak to it, but this was negotiated with MedCai and that is a kind of concern. We don't want them to come back and say, we made an agreement, now you've changed it. That's our, I think that's our only concern, but she may wish to respond to this. Yeah, well, um, uh, if I can let, speak. Hold, hold on, Ms. Uh, Horton. Um, we may be sending uh, some of today's bills to the uh, health subcommittee. So some of this can also be worked out there. Uh, briefly, Ms. Horton. Yeah, so honestly, um, this is why the bill was introduced with a much more broader scope from the beginning so that we don't have to come back every single time to make amendments to the bill as other public health needs um, become more, uh, 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 that, that kind of rise to the top. Um, but again, we did negotiate this and I, I think I'm hoping that there are some other ways to address it through some support from the committee through an executive order or some other ways that we can get this addressed because pharmacists can most certainly um, do injections for antibiotics for STIs. I don't know that it needs to go through that full um, process with this bill. So if we could get support from the committee, that would be fantastic um, to work directly with the Maryland Department of Health to make this happen and then possibly amend the bill next year. Um, but this is really what we wanted to avoid. Okay, further questions for Senator Young or his panel? Further questions? Seeing none, uh, that concludes the hearing on Senator Young's bill. Um, Madam Vice Chairman. The next bill was Senate Bill 139, Senator Carosa. Well, thank you, Madam Vice Chair and members of the Distinguished Senate Education, Health and Environmental Affairs Committee. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to um, present and ask for your support for Senate Bill 139, Interstate Occupational Therapy Licensure Compact. This bill establishes an interstate licensure compact for occupational therapists. This means that occupational therapists can work across state lines just as long as they are licensed by a member of the compact. The Maryland General Assembly already has enacted similar legislation for physicians, nurses, and physical therapists. This bipartisan legislation is a high priority as many of us regularly hear from providers and constituents in our districts of the need for greater access to healthcare services. Occupational therapy services are particularly important as these services allow some of our most vulnerable constituents to live more independently. We need to ensure that older adults, children with special needs and individuals recovering from injuries have the services they need to live as fully as possible. As I worked with healthcare providers during the COVID-19 crisis during the interim, it was brought to my attention by members of the Maryland Occupational Therapy Association that this interstate occupational therapy licensure compact would have a direct benefit in increasing access to care, especially in districts like mine, which are bordered by states, Delaware to the north and Virginia to the south. Occupational therapists are critical healthcare providers. They help people maintain as much independence as possible. And many of our districts are hard hit by the, the healthcare workforce shortages, especially in rural parts of the state. 
our hospitals, schools, long-term care facilities, and community providers need more flexibility in recruiting qualified healthcare providers to provide both in-person and telehealth services. Licensure's compacts offer an important pathway to ensuring our healthcare facilities and providers have a sufficient number of qualified providers, making it easier for licensed healthcare practitioners from neighboring states to work in our hospitals and programs in our communities. I'd also like to point out to my colleagues that the compact also would support military spouses. Those military spouses who are healthcare practitioners would not have the burden of obtaining a new license every time they move to a different state. Madam Vice Chair, this bill continues our committee's important work on telehealth. I supported and appreciated having the opportunity to work with our Vice Chair on her emergency telehealth bill, Senate Bill 402, last year, which as my colleagues know, was one of the few bills that was signed into law by Governor Hogan rather than just allowed to go into effect. During the deliberations of the telehealth bill, Senator Kagan encouraged me to work on an amendment that underscored the importance of interstate compacts. Specifically, the amendment uh, supported by this committee um, included the legislative intent that the governor facilitate the joining of the state with adjacent states and jurisdictions in interstate compacts, regulating healthcare practitioners to improve patient access to healthcare practitioners in state communities experiencing a health practitioner shortage. Uh, Madam Vice Chair and colleagues, this amendment laid the groundwork for the introduction of this Occupational Therapy Licensure Compact Bill before you today. Telehealth is an incredible innovation and it has helped us ensure access to healthcare during the pandemic. In looking to the future, we need to create an avenue for telehealth providers to cross state lines and provide services virtually. I am pleased to report that this, this bill has broad support, including the Maryland Occupational Therapy Association, the Board of Occupational Therapy Practice, the Maryland Hospital Association, and the Maryland Rural Health Association. My panel today will explain a little more background about the development of the compact and how this compact will support access in all of our communities. I will mention that I've included a set of amendments in my testimony package. These amendments are entirely technical as compact laws need to be consistent across states. I respectfully ask my colleagues um, for a favorable report and for your kind consideration. And our next witness would be Rachel Faulkner, I believe. Madam Vice Chair, back to you. Thank you, Senator Carroza. Uh, we have four proponents who will be testifying today. You mentioned that Rachel Faulkner would be your first. We also have Dory Gal Lambert from Building Bridges Pediatric Services in Salisbury, and Sonia Lawson and Noel Welch, neither of whom listed an affiliation, if you can make sure you make that clear. Let's go to Rachel Faulkner. Thank you, um, Vice Chair uh, Kagan and members of the committee. Uh, Rachel Faulkner with the Maryland Occupational Therapy Association. And I'm gonna be really brief. I think that the, uh, the three uh, persons going after me um, are gonna do a great job really talking about what is occupational therapy and the, the real benefits of, um, of this bill. Um, I just wanna briefly say that this was um, a multi-year effort um, that included the American Occupational Therapy Association and the National Board for certification in occupational therapy. And they're the group that um, manages the uh, licensing e exam for um, occupational therapists across the country. Um, and this effort was led by the Council of State Governments. So they brought together a national team, uh, which included states um, to create some um, central standards uh, for states that join the compact. Um, we're expecting this year, this is the, the first year that um, legislation can be introduced. Uh, that around 13 states are considering bills at this point. I um, mean, it only takes 10 states for the compact to go into effect. So it's reasonable to think that if Maryland were to join this year, that we could have a compact up and running very quickly. Um, we're really excited when we talk about um, what's, you know, um, being so close to other states and, and being in a compact region um, that Virginia and Delaware are, are planning to have legislation this year. Um, Pennsylvania, which has a, a year long session is also considering it. Um, and I do have an update that um, Virginia 
passed their Senate bill out of committee. And if they haven't already, they were expected to pass it out of the Senate today unanimously. Um, so if Maryland were to join the compact, which we really hope um, we do this year, um, we could immediately start um, working with practitioners in Virginia to have a real comprehensive um, a collaboration with occupational therapists across both states. Um, and then I think um, uh, Senator Crows also mentioned, may have mentioned Delaware's um, also planning to have legislation. So, so in a very quick amount of time, we could see this compact up and running and really benefiting um, the state of Maryland. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. Uh, next, Ms. Gal Lambert. Hi, my name is Dory Gal Lambert. I'm an occupational therapist and I'm also the owner of Building Bridges Pediatric Therapy Services. Um, could speak up a little bit. <clears throat> okay, sorry. A little we're closer. Here on, here on the Eastern shore of Maryland. Um, I do have two clinics. One is in Salisbury in Wicomico County and one is in Easton um, in Talbot County. Um, we see predominantly um, a lot of our children and families come are from the state of Maryland, although we have a significant number from the states of Delaware and Virginia as well, being here on the Delmarva Peninsula. Um, so a couple things I wanted to share today. Um, with the pandemic, um, as when, and everything had to shut down. Um, we had to close our clinics and shift our service delivery model quickly over to telehealth services. Um, that posed an issue because all of a sudden the children that were coming to us were now in their homes in these neighboring states. Um, due to current licensure laws, we were not allowed to provide um, treatment to those children, occupational therapy services. Um, I worked for several weeks in trying to contact those uh, licensure boards for an exception to be made so that these, um, the children's um, plans of care were not interrupted. But it did take multiple weeks for to get approval for the children that we were currently seeing we were not allowed to see any new children and add any new children to our caseloads. Um, that in itself posed an issue because as the pandemic went along, parents were recognizing more and more needs of their children and reaching out to us to seek services. And we were not permitted to then bring those children onto our caseloads. Um, and I think it's worth saying also that if it had not been a pandemic, um, we would not have been permitted to see those children via telehealth. Um, Ms. Gal Lambert, if I could ask you to sit closer to your microphone and let's start to wrap up, please. Sure. Thank um, you. The only other thing I wanted to mention is that being in a rural area, the um, it is very difficult to find therapists as an employer. And I currently have waiting lists for all services, and it's only because I don't have the therapist to provide those services. So the compact would allow me to, or anyone to, um, to uh, try to bring in therapists from our neighboring states and they may be more willing to come to the state of Maryland to provide services if they didn't have to go through those other licensure. Um, uh. Thank you very much, Ms. Gal Lambert. Thank you for your testimony. Just to remind everybody who's uh, either testifying or observing, the first witness gets five minutes, and after that, each subsequent witness, and there's limit of four, only gets two and a half minutes. So I know that's hard to say everything you want to say. So if you can just be cognizant of that. We want to be a little flexible, but we really have a lot of bills today. So Noel Welch, why don't you go next? And if you could identify your affiliation and make sure we can hear you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and Committee. My name is Noelle Welch. I'm an occupational therapist at Coordinated Movements, Inc., a pediatric therapy clinic in Southern Maryland. Thank you for the opportunity to share my support for Senate Bill 139. This legislation will be extremely beneficial as it will improve access to OT services across state lines, especially border states. I have two examples from many that occurred this past year to share with you that demonstrated how this compact would be beneficial. When the COVID-19 pandemic began, I had siblings who received therapy with my practice 
temporarily have to relocate to New Jersey to stay with their grandparents. Their mother requested they continue to receive their therapy services via telehealth. In order to provide them continued therapy services, each of their treating therapists had to apply for a temporary license in New Jersey. We applied for the temporary licenses and when each therapist received their temporary license, they scheduled the, ther the children for therapy. If New Jersey was in the compact, the continuity of care would have been maintained without the lapse, waiting for the licenses. Another example involves children we see who live in the neighboring state of Virginia. Initially, when the pandemic began, Virginia did not allow therapists who, who were not licensed in Virginia to provide telehealth services to their residents. This caused a lapse in therapy for several clients. Virginia did change their regulations and allowed us to provide services. However, a lapse did still occur. The Interstate Occupational Therapy Licensure, Licensure Compact will improve consumer access and continuity in care. Thank you for considering this legislation and for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Welch, appreciate it. And next, uh, wrapping us up, Sonia Lawson. Good afternoon to the committee. My name is Sonia Lawson, and I'm um, representing the Maryland Occupational Therapy Association and our committee on advocacy. Overwhelmingly, the members of the Maryland Occupational Therapy Association are excited to have this opportunity to have a favorable outcome for Senate Bill 139, the Interstate Occupational Therapy Compact. Licensure reciprocity is our top priority. It will allow practitioners to meet critical workforce needs and provide services to, every, to people from children to older adults to enable them to actually participate in everyday life in doing the activities that are most meaningful to them using restorative and adaptive approaches. We want to express our sincere gratitude to Senator Carroza for sponsoring this bill. Great, short and sweet, very effective. Thank you, Ms. Lawson. Let me just flag for colleagues that Brett Linninger, uh, Sherry Nickerson, Jennifer Witten, and the Department of Health also submitted testimony, written testimony that was favorable. You can take a look at that. Barbara Bocato, Emily Aronson from Kennedy Krieger, Krieger Samantha Oroz from the Maryland Rural Health Association. So all of those were written and they are all favorable and in, available to you online. Uh, I see no hands raised. Do any senators have questions for any of the witnesses? Seeing none, that concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 139. Thank you, Senator Carroza. Good job. Uh, the next bill is Senate Bill 167, Senator West. And Senator West has not yet joined us, but he's on his way imminently, I think. So we'll just give that a moment. I'll read the title of the bill to buy us some time. <laughs> Senate Bill 167 is the State Board of Social Work Examiner's Temporary License to Practice Social Work. And there is unfavorable testimony to this and one favorable with amendments. So we will want to Focus on the details on this one. Senator West. Hmm. Is there another bill? Is Senator Young still here? All right, colleagues, we've got some uh, delays here. I understand that Senator West is joining us. There we go. All right, Senator West, welcome back to Education, Health and Environmental Affairs. I have introduced your bill. We're on Senate Bill 167. There are proponents, opponents, and favorable with amendments. So why don't you kick us off and tell us about your bill? Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. And I'm, again, I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, frankly, my office just learned that I was wanted about 45 seconds ago. 
<laughs> well, I got, I got no heads up on this. Okay, we're glad you're okay. here. So that's why I'm glad you're here too. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be able to present Senate Bill 167. Um, this bill will confer on the State Board of Social Work Examiners the power to issue temporary licenses to social worker applicants who except for passing the examination at the end of their program have met the appropriate education and experience requirements to be licensed as social workers. Obviously the bill, the bill was inspired by the current pandemic in which emergency situations have occurred frequently. But please note that in this bill, the decision whether to exercise this power will be entirely discretionary on the part of the board. There's nothing in this bill that mandates the board merely putting another quiver in the arrow in the quiver of the board members. The bill further provides that in the event the board should decide to issue temporary licenses for bachelor social workers and or master social workers, the temporary licenses may only licensees may only practice social work under the supervision of a board approved supervisor. Uh, in the event the board should decide temporary licenses for certified social workers and or certified clinical social workers, the temporary licensees can practice social work without supervision. Under the bill, any temporary social work licenses will only be valid until such time as the licensee either fails to pass the requirement, fails to submit the exam results to the board, or becomes a permanent licensed social worker. In the event the board should decide to issue temporary licenses, the board will be able to adding additional provisions governing the temporary licenses. So the board will not only be given total discretion whether or not to issue temporary licenses, but it will also have the power to restrict and regulate the temporary licensees practices. In view of the emergency situation engendered by the coronavirus pandemic, it should be obvious that our statutes should contain fallback provisions that can be invoked in crises. If we're very fortunate, the board should never need to consider issuing temporary licenses. But Senate Bill 167 puts that arrow into their quiver so that in a pinch, they could deploy it. I note that various other Maryland state licensing boards currently have the power to issue temporary licenses. These include the State Board of Dental Examiners, the State Board of Morticians and Funeral Directors, the State Board of Nursing, the State Oc Board of Occupational Therapy Practice, and the State Board of Physicians. Furthermore, both Virginia and Minnesota have temporary licensure for social workers in effect for emergencies, and eight other states, including West Virginia and New York, have temporary or provisional licensure for social workers as a permanent part of their licensing laws. The bottom line is that in future emergency situations, we should be prepared for any eventualities, and it just makes sense to permit the State, State Board of Social Work Examiners to make the decision to issue temporary licenses in such situations. And for these reasons, I ask the committee to vote favorably on Senate Bill 167. Look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Senator West. Thank you for your testimony. Um, is your next, is your lead witness, Ms. McClellan, Ms. Schaefer, or Ms. Perez? Would you have yes, a- Yes, Ms. McClellan, I think is our lead witness today. Okay, uh, no, we've got three actually. So Daphne McClellan from the Maryland chapter of the National Association of Social Workers. Welcome, Ms. McClellan. Good afternoon, Senator and members of the committee. Um, thank you for letting me uh, testify today. I'm Daphne McClellan, uh, Executive Director of the National Association of Social Workers, Maryland chapter. And thank you, uh, Senator West, for introducing uh, what we think is very important legislation. Last April, um, when we were fully into the pandemic and everybody was you know, trying to figure out what was happening, we got an email from a number of students uh, who were social work master's degree students. They copied the National Association of Social Workers along with the Board of Social Work Examiners because they were very concerned about their inability to take the licensing exam. In Maryland, during your last semester of your master's program or your BSW program, you are able to uh, begin your application to be licensed. Uh, you uh, have to pass a criminal background check. You have to you know, submit the proper uh, funding. And then you are allowed by the board to sit for the exam, which is required for your license. If you pass the exam, then as soon as your uh, institution uh, 
verifies that you have graduated, then you can become licensed right away. And this is very important to students who hope to be employed immediately um, after graduating. What was happening was these students were um, beginning the process, they were being approved to take the license in exam, and then they found out that the licensing exams were not being offered. Everything had been closed down because of COVID. Uh, and they were panicking about their ability to um, you know, become licensed so that they could accept jobs which were being offered to them. Uh, so we, uh, many of these students attended the April meeting of the Board of Social Work Examiners. They expressed their concerns to the board. There were dozens and dozens of students um, as part of that virtual meeting. And the board uh, seemed very uh, empathetic with the concerns of the students. They went into a um, private session. They came back again later that afternoon and they announced that they were sorry there was nothing they could do to help the students with some sort of provisional or temporary license because the statute for um, social work practice did not permit it. So really that is where this bill came from. We wanted to make sure that there would be a provision within the Social Work Practice Act that would permit temporary licensure in the event of some sort of emergency situation as we have been uh, facing. Uh, currently, people are being able to take the licensing exam. Um, it's slower uh, because there's fewer spots because of social distancing, but Pearson View, which is the national exam company, has opened up spaces. So this isn't an immediate problem. I know that the Board of Social Work Examiners is facing a lot of um, you know, difficult situations right now with the uh, expanded time limit for people being able to renew their licenses and people working from home. And you know, the idea of offering temporary licensure right now might be overwhelming for the board, but what we're really looking for is to put something in statute for future situations um, that we don't know what they might be, but we don't want to have another situation where the board says, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do to help you because our statute doesn't permit any kind of temporary licensure. There are other health occupation boards that permit it, um, within Maryland. And so we know that this you know, should be able to um, be true also for social workers. And we also know that around this country, there are at least 10 states where temporary licensure is just a normal part of what a person does when they apply for licensure. They apply and they are given a temporary license for anywhere from 90 days to a year uh, where they can practice as social workers while they await the opportunity to take the uh, licensing exam or pass the licensing exam. So it's not unheard of. Um, it's the same licensing exam that's used um, all over the country. So this isn't something that would say, you know, we would be um, making uh, citizens in Maryland more at risk than citizens are in Texas or New York or Connecticut, where there's this is a normal part of how they do business. So we hope that um, you will give this opportunity uh, to the Board of Social Work Examiners to have this as something available to them should it be needed in the future. And we uh, ask for your support of Senate Bill 167. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McClellan. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Dawn Schaefer, University of Maryland School of Social Worker. You have two and a half minutes. Good afternoon, senators and members of the committee. My name is Dawn Schaefer. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Schaefer. Can you hold on just one moment? Senator West is trying to share Absolutely. something with the committee, but he's sure. muted. Okay. Senator West, if you could unmute. Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm being called by another committee. I hate to run, but... Um, we totally understand. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator West. Yes. If we're, I apologize for interrupting you. Please continue or start again, if you would. Okay. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Senator and members of the committee. My name is Dawn Schaefer, and I'm the Associate Dean for Student Affairs at the University of Maryland School of Social Work. I'm also an LCSWC and a board approved supervisor. I'm testifying today on behalf of the University of Maryland School of Social Work community in favor of Senate Bill 167. I first became involved in the discussion of temporary licensure when I was approached by graduating MSW students in March 2020. At that time, many students who had already scheduled their LMSW exams were being contacted by testing centers who were closing due to COVID-19. Exams were delayed by weeks um, to several months, resulting in rescinded job offers, loss of income, and compounding stressors during an already difficult time. Our students wanted to aid in the public health response required by the pandemic, but without a viable path to licensure were unable to do so. The School of Social Work was eager to be involved in creating a solution that our graduating students um, so that they could begin their careers while serving the community during this time of international crisis. 
Within the first week of my initial outreach, 52 students volunteered to participate in direct advocacy efforts, 76 students provided their concerns in writing, and 50 leaders at the school signed a request for the adoption of temporary measures. I share these numbers um, to convey the degree to which this has impacted our community and the magnitude to which we are committed to finding a solution. We at the school know that our students are well qualified to begin serving immediately upon graduation. We're a highly ranked program accredited by the Council on Social Work Education. We prepare our students through rigorous coursework and two years of field practicum. A large percentage of our students pass the LMSW on their first attempt, many before they even graduate. If temporary licensure were awarded, those in possession would still practice under a fully licensed social worker, thus temporary licensure does not pose a risk to the public. Social workers understand the implications for healthcare inequities that lead to worse outcomes for underserved communities, the same communities who are more impacted by public health crises. In the example of COVID-19, the public health crisis created greater demand for services, but fewer providers to serve given the re reduction in test availability. This impact was also felt by the recent graduates who were unable to secure employment, thus impacting their ability to pay their bills and begin their student loan repayment. Many graduates remained in non-social work positions despite being qualified in other ways. Having access to expedient licensing processes, particularly during, during times of crisis, is vital for social workers, clients, and employers. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Schaefer. And Chloe Perez, Hearts and Home for you. Ms. Perez, two and a half. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Senator and members of the committee for allowing me and my uh, colleagues to testify, testify on behalf of this bill. I am the CEO of Hearts and Homes for Youth and we're a private um, nonprofit that works with youth and the child welfare. I'm also the chair of MARFI, which is the Maryland Association of Resources for Family and Youth. And we do advocacy and legislative work on behalf of all of the private nonprofits uh, in Maryland that work in the child welfare realm. So we're providing group home services, therapeutic foster care, independent living services for youth and families in, in the community. Um, we had an existing problem and challenge with hiring social workers prior to COVID, and it has just been magnified by the pandemic. We've experienced difficulty in hiring social workers and have worked closely with the University of Maryland and with the state to try to address some of the national shortage that, again, has just been compounded with COVID. Um, it is a time in which the mental health needs of our young people and our families are severely exacerbated and the child welfare system in general is experiencing lack of resources. Due to the lack of accessibility to take tests timely, I'm one of the employers that has had to rescind offers because of that issue and have also had vacancies in some of our programs for nine plus months which means that our young people are not receiving the trauma-informed clinical services or that we're having to outsource our services, which also has a significant financial impact on providers at a time when we're already struggling um, with financial resources. What we are seeing is that we're having directors and administrators having to fill this role, which is not sustainable because their position requires working on more of a macro level and especially helping us get through this pandemic. Um, to um, Ms. Schaefer's point, when we do have um, young social workers come out of school and graduate, they're under very um, comprehensive supervision by an LCSWC supervisor. So to ensure that their services that they are providing meet social work standards, meet our state regulations, and to ensure that we're providing the highest quality of care for our young people and families. Um, I highly recommend that this bill is passed to allow us some flexibility in the statute so that the current crisis is not um, magnified to a point of doing even more damage to our young people and our communities, especially given that we're anticipating a significant spike in CPS reports and calls once the pandemic lifts because our young people have not been seen in so long. So, I don't see any um, reason why this would not just benefit us as a whole. And, and based on our social work um, ethics and governance to our board, we would ensure that we are meeting social work standards. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Perez. And CPS, for anyone watching, is Child Protective Services. So acronyms sometimes can confuse and lose people. Um, could you just LCSW, the dash C means what, please? Uh, licensed Certified Social Worker Clinical. So See, clinical. Level. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Senator Carosa. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. I'll be brief. I wanted to direct my question to uh, Dr. McClellan. And I know we're focused on the need for this because of COVID-19, but my, my question goes back to, um, you know, social work is really hard work and it's burnout work. And, you know, I actually had a family member who I hope would stick with it, but after a few years, it, it just was too much. And I guess I wanted to ask Dr. McClellan, do you see this not only, not just for this, um, you know, period with the COVID, but also maybe a boost, a morale booster to the value and per possibly for future retention if, if we can allow something like this? Because uh, obviously it looks like they want to they want to join faster. And I think if we can respond to that, we might be able to retain more of our social workers. But I'm, I'm speculating as a non-expert. Can you respond to that? Uh, thank you, Senator. Well, I think that our current statute um, really provides the opportunity for people to get licensed as quickly as possible, since it does permit people to apply and take the exam in the last semester of their graduate or undergraduate program. So I think, I think the, if it works properly, things are good the way they are. But this is really for emergency situations. And I do think um, the board providing for the uh, emergency situations would get would be a morale booster to say, hey, when there is an emergency, we believe you are first responders and you are very important to the health care um, that we offer to the citizens of our state. And we want to make sure that you can get licensed as soon as possible. Um, so, yes, in that sense, I believe that you're exactly right. Thank you, Dr. McClellan. Uh, we do have a favorable with amendment from Tina Dove with the Maryland State Education Association, which colleagues will be able to find. There are two oral unfavorable witnesses, Gerald Farrell from the Board of Social Work Examiners and Stanley Weinstein, same, same uh, affiliation. Mr. Farrell, if you could please speak and you get two and a half minutes. Good afternoon, Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today on the matter of Senate Bill 167. I am Jerry Farrell, Chair of the Maryland Board of Social Work Examiners, and I speak today on behalf of the full board. I should also note that I am not a social worker. Rather, I am one of two consumer members on the board. I am a retired Navy captain and a retired nonprofit executive and a member of the Board of Social Work Examiners for more than four years now. Our board... Oh, um, Jerry, we just lost you. Can you please unmute again, please? We had you for a while. Here we go. Sorry about that. You're good. Here, where my fingers go here. <laughs> the, uh, our board unanimously and strongly opposes the idea of temporary licenses for social workers for multiple reasons. And we cannot envision any circumstances, including what we experienced last year, that would move the board to implement temporary licenses as envisioned by this bill. The proposed legislation is a solution is it's a solution in search of a problem and would set an unfortunate precedent with unforeseen and unintended consequences for all health professions in the state. The notion that the social work profession needs temporary licenses is driven by a one time unique short lived issue arising because of the current pandemic availability of testing for licensure an issue which is already resolved. There is no demonstrable need for temporary licenses for social workers in Maryland. The number of applicants for licensure taking the exam now is not statistically significantly different than in recent years. Further, there is no guarantee that temporarily licensed social workers would be employed in the areas with the greatest need. And there is anecdotal evidence that employers would be disinclined to hire social workers with a temporary license. By allowing individuals to practice social work without demonstrating some minimal level of competence, temporary licensees would increase risk to the public, the exact opposite of the board's mission to protect the public. The, the bill would effectively eliminate any standards of professionalism for social workers in Maryland. Just as law school graduates with a Juris Doctorate are not allowed to practice law until they can demonstrate some minimal competence by passing the bar exam, 
where medical school graduates cannot perform surgery, surgery until they pass a board exam. Neither should graduate, graduates with a social work degree be allowed to practice until able to demonstrate some minimal level of competency, competency by passing the licensing exam. Allowing everyone with a bachelor's or master's degree in social work to practice as a temporarily licensed social worker without having passed the exam would undermine the professional reputation of all social workers in Maryland and place the vulnerable at-risk population exposed to these unproved social workers at great risk. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Farrell. Mr. Weinstein. Is he with us? All right, I'm not seeing or hearing him. I'll give him another moment. I think, Mr. Farrell, you will have expressed the views then of the- uh, I, I think, can you hear me now? Now I can, super, thank okay. you. <laughs> Madam Vice Chair and Welcome. committee members, hi, I'm Stan Weinstein, Executive Director of the Maryland Board of Social Work Examiners. I'm also a social worker. Uh, SB 167 is focused on giving the board the ability to provide a temporary license to graduates from a school social work or an undergraduate social work program who has not taken the national exam. The board does not want this authority because the board wants everyone who was helped or treated by a social worker in Maryland to know that their social worker has met the minimum standard of knowledge, skill, and ethics to practice safely. And this is important when you consider that there's a fail rate of 23% in 2019. Why would someone want to be treated by someone who has not met this minimum standard? I believe the clients and patients with resources will choose to not be treated by such a social worker. And in the end, it will be the poor and vulnerable who may not have a choice. This came about, as we've said, because of the pandemic crisis. And for 45 years before, this was not a problem. To follow safety guidelines, the testing company discontinued the testing in order to set up protocols and social distancing. And as a result, there was this backlog and it did take time. But their statistics show that in 2020, they tested more applicants then in 2019. So they recovered from that. This was a short-term, one-time issue. Social workers provide most of the mental health treatment in the state of Maryland, as they do around the country. They work with the vulnerable populations, uh, including those who may be suicidal, victims of child abuse, or domestic violence. This is serious service and requires competent practitioners now, some may say that uh, they will be supervised, and wouldn't that be enough? Supervision has been critical for the 45 years, but there are limitations to social work supervision. In contrast to the supervision of nurses and occupational therapists and physical therapists, the, the supervisors in the room. Social work supervision doesn't work that way. The treatment of a social worker with a client or a patient is behind closed doors. It's much more complicated, but it's more responsibility on the supervisor. And you don't observe all the details, particularly in very vulnerable populations. Lastly, if the board has the authority, what will be the standard that we will use to say, this one person meets the requirement to uh, have a temporary license and this one doesn't. I think licensees or applicants for licensees to become a licensee will apply to the board once they know that the board has the power to do it. It's not mm -hmm. waiting for another pandemic. It's there and that people will say, well, I've been sick. I've been out of the country. I have this job that requires I be there immediately. How do Thank we you. subjectively determine who gets that temporary li license and who doesn't? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weinstein. So it is awkward to try to make all your views known in a limited space of time. Mr. Farrell, thank you for your service on the commission as a public representative. Your, uh, your 
Um, those representatives are really important to the service of our state. So thank you for that. Um, I don't see hands raised from colleagues. I'll give it another moment. Senator Hester, go for it. Thank you, Madam. Uh, you just remuted yourself. There you go. Sorry about that. I don't know if anybody could answer this question, but it was brought it was brought to the committee's attention that some of our boards offer temporary licensures and some don't. Do we have a list of which ones do and which ones? I think we can see whether our talented new legal counsel either might have that information or get it to us before we consider this bill. That would be helpful. Thank Alexis, I don't want to put you on the spot. Let's, you'll, you can maybe get that information. Okay. Thank, Thank you for the you question, sure. Senator Hester. If I can come in, I think you will find that those who have a temporary license, and I can't be certain of this, have supervision that's in the room when uh, the, the, the temporary licensee is practicing. Okay, we will let legal counsel um, fill us in on that. Thank you, Mr. Weinstein. If I could ask possibly both proponents and opponents to see if you can take a look at the favorable with amendments and see if that modifies your views and what you think of that uh, and circle back to us in the next few days, that would be great. Sure. Uh, no other questions, that will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 167. Thank you all for your testimony. Mr. Chairman. Okay, um, uh, we're going to um, Senator Patterson, then back to you, Senator Young. So you'll have to hold tight or come back. Um, Senator Patterson, Senate Bill 169. Uh, yes. He will be followed by uh, Adam Lowy, uh, Block, uh, Justin Lewis, and uh, Vincent uh, Martirana. And um, there's one uh, oral unfavorable. There are two, actually, two uh, oral unfavorable. Uh, they, and afterwards, I see no amendments. So they'll be. There will be. After <laughs> questions, uh, Lorelai Ma and Gene Ransom. So, Senator Patterson, you're on. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members of uh, the best committee in the state. Uh, I do appreciate this opportunity to uh, introduce Senate Bill 169. Um, Senate Bill 169 is a bill that gives due acknowledgement to a group of professionals that diagnose treatments and care for all of us in that specialized area. Podiatrists are bound by the same regulations and guidelines for uh, uh, oversight, uh, similar to that of the health insurance, uh, uh, yeah, accountability act, and the same type of training that other doctors as well, uh, the, uh, the podiatrists receive in essence, just about the identical type of training. This bill gives uh, podiatrists the title and recognition that they deserve by uh, formally and officially referring to these healthcare professionals in text and in title from podiatrists to podiatrist physicians. Uh, this is basically the scope of the bill, just that minor, minor change. Uh, I believe there probably will be 36 other states that have already enacted changes to reflect uh, uh, podiatrist physicians. And uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I do hope that this committee will, will vote favorable on this bill. And uh, there are three expert witnesses that will be available for uh, further uh, information and uh, respond to questions that you might have. And the lead person, I believe, is Justin Lewis, who will be followed by two additional witnesses. And with that, um, I, I thank you very kindly. And um, I am en route to get my vaccine. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Lewis. Yes, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, members of the committee. My name is Dr. Justin Lewis. I'm a podiatrist, uh, foot and ankle surgeon, practicing in Carroll County for the past 10 years. I am the president of the Maryland Podiatric Medical Association. Uh, I've been on the executive board for eight years. Uh, this is not my first rodeo. I've been down this road before. I have testified in front of this committee before on scope issues, which were never fun. And I know you all love scope issues so much. Uh, but rest assured, this is not a scope issue, okay? Um, we still have opposition, as expected. 
but this does not change our scope. This does not expand our ability to practice. This does not interfere with the MDs or DOs ability to practice. This does not change Comar and Comar states that a physician in Maryland is someone with a degree of MD or DO. This does not change that. This changes our terminology from podiatrist to podiatric physician. Now we're getting into terms and words and physician, you know, Meg Kai will and the American Medical Association will try to hold a sacred uh, as a term that no one else can use. And when we look at terms and words, you know, if you take the, the word president and you add vice in front of it, it changes that term. Um, if you take the term physician and you add assistant after it, it changes, even though they both have physician in it. And no different if you add podiatric physician together. They're similar, but they are not one in the same. Currently, while my the most hospital bylaws already include podiatrists as physicians, okay? We get badges that state physician right on them. I'm headed to the hospital later today. Uh, we park in the physician parking lot. Uh, in addition, this COVID-19 pandemic, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security identified physicians as critical infrastructure workers. And the U.S. Department of Homeland Security designated three degrees as those physicians, MD, DO, and DPM, which is the doctor of podiatric medicine. Now, MedKai is going to uh, you know, present uh, a study from the American Medical Association stating about how the majority of respondents and polling people state that someone as a physician should be an MD or DO. And what we know about polls and surveys is that they can be biased. As elected officials, you all know this. You know the importance of polls, but the first thing we do is we look at the small print on the TV screen to see who sponsored the poll to see if there's bias. And these polls were sponsored by the American Medical Association. In addition, we also know that polls can be wrong, flat out wrong. We all know this from the 2016 presidential election. Polls can be wrong. So they are gonna ex uh, explain that poll. There's also an unfair grouping of our profession with other professions, with dentists and chiropractors and optometrists. And it is different because we have a different education model and we call it the 443 model, which is four years of undergrad, four years of medical, and three years or more of residency training. MDs have that 443 model, DOs do, and so do podiatrists. The chiropractors, the physician assistants, they do not. There will also be talk of possibly waiting, okay? Wait and see is what Meg Kai would like to say that there might be a national stance on the use of the term physician by a podiatrist. And that's a wait and see delay tactic is all it is. And that's what the American Medical Association loves to do. Okay, and if, to give you historical context, in 1917, World War I, the DOs tried to join the US military as physicians in World War I, and they were denied. And they went to US Congress and Congress passed a bill to allow them to take the test. And President Theodore Roosevelt approved it. And in 1917, they still denied them because of opposition from the American Medical Association and the U.S. Surgeon General. Finally, a DO did get accepted into the U.S. military as a physician, and it was in 1966. It took 50 years of opposition from the American Medical Association and delay tactics and wait and see, wait and see before they were able to join the U.S. military as a physician. And that's the osteopaths who are considered physicians right now. So I, I will not support them to wait and see because wait and see might be 40 years from now and I'll be long gone. In closing, I'll say this. I am not from Maryland. Uh, I'm an Air Force brat. I was born on an Air Force base. I traveled the country. I followed my father around with the family. There is no hometown for me. And Maryland is now my hometown. I've lived here for 10 years. I've had three sons born here now and there are Marylanders. And what I do know is that Maryland from what I've gathered from living here for 10 years is a progressive state and it's based on history and tradition. That is exactly what this bill is. It's a progression of our profession based on history and tradition, okay? And it's, it reflects what Maryland is. 36 other states have recognized it. I implore you to make Maryland 37 and to support this bill. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Dr. Lewis, appreciate it. We will hear now for two and a half minutes each from Adam Lowy, Richard Block, and uh, Vincent Mantarana. Um, Martirano, sorry. So Adam Lowy, why don't you kick us off, please? Uh, uh, good afternoon, Chair Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, members of the committee. Uh, Ch Vice Chair, could you just give me a thumbs up? You can hear me okay? You're good. All right. My name is Adam Lowy. I'm here to ask for a favorable outcome of Podiatric Physician Senate Bill 169. I'm a lifelong Baltimorean living in Howard County, practice, private practice in Montgomery and Prince George's County. Today, I'd like to talk about the American Medical Association's Truth and Advertising Campaign. 
This campaign is, high, is based on a highly subjective and flawed survey, which is something that opponents of this bill have been using as evidence to support their position the last few years. This telephone-based survey conducted between 2008 and 2014 asked 850 adults across the country a variety of questions of their knowledge of healthcare providers, namely which specialists in healthcare were physicians. Results of the study reveal when looking closely at the numbers that the general public sees specialists in two categories of whom they think is a medical doctor. One category are allied healthcare providers such as optometrists, psychologists, and chiropractors, which less than 50% of the public knows are not medical doctors. The other category consists of the various medical and surgical specialties. To compare ourselves to the next specialty on the list, the same 22% of participants answered that an anesthesiologist and a podiatrist are not medical doctors. 91% believe that medical schooling and training are vital to optimal patient care compared to nurse practitioner schooling. A podiatrist follows the 443 training model, as does a general practitioner, an ER doctor, or a pediatrician. A physician's assistant, which follows the 42 training model, has by no comparison the same education or training as a podiatrist to have it to be able to be a part of their title. My question is, should a podiatrist who performs surgical procedures alone without the guidance of others to be able to title themselves as a podiatric physician? Committee members, this survey by the AMA has shown that the public has the perception that podiatrists are clearly closely aligned to our medical and osteopathic colleagues, much more than non-surgical allied health providers. While the public is confused by who is providing their medical services to them in MD and DO offices, by nurse practitioners or physician's assistants, or even if they're gonna to get to see the physician, they know they're only getting podiatric medical services from one place, and that's from a doctor of podiatric medicine. Those that oppose this bill are concerned about diluting the name of the title physician. However, given our similar 443 training to others and wide range of acceptance and integration into the healthcare provider community, any doctor with physician in its title will be maintained for those the highest standards, like a podiatric physician. And for that, I ask for a favorable vote. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lowy. Next, Mr. Block. Thank you. Uh, uh, chair and vice chair and members of the committee, uh, I've been representing the Maryland Podiatric Medical Association for 40 years and have been their executive director since 1997. I am familiar also with the physician community having represented them in past uh, employment. The reality is that under Maryland law, a podiatrist today is required to have two years of postgraduate training under the statute, whereas a physician only has to have one under the statute. The residency requirements for physicians who are generally licensed vary from specialty to specialty. Several do not require the three years that Maryland requires uh, and licensing requires for podiatrists. Graduation nationally requires three years of residency for podiatrists. It is important to remember that podiatry is one of the only surgical professions other than MDs and DOs and dentists. And dentists do not want to be called physicians. But in order to give this profession the recognition of its education and training, I would urge you strongly to pass this bill and give podiatry it's due as podiatric physicians. And with that, I urge you to move on and give this the favorable report. And I would Thank turn you. it over, if I may, to Dr. Martirana. I was just gonna call on Vince Martirana. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of the EAGA committee. My name is Dr. Vincent Moderato, and I've been practicing podiatric medicine and surgery in our great state since 1978. I'd like to share with you that as a medical professional, we serve side by side with our MD and DO physician colleagues, not only at bedside, but on hospital committees. In fact, it was an orthopedic surgeon that initially nominated me to be a physician member of our medical executive committee. 
He was also uh, recommended that podiatric surgery be its own section, independent of orthopedic or general surgery. Frankly, I, I never felt that was considered anything other than a podiatric physician. In fact, recently I was amused because I came across my commencement address to my classmates uh, some 43 years ago, in which I used precisely the same term describing uh, what our role was as podiatric physicians. Um, physician, podiatric physician, as has been mentioned, is been a term that's been used to describe us in 36 other states. And uh, we serve with our MD and DL colleagues in the role of, count how many times I say physician, physician members of hospital medical executive committees, uh, physician members of virtually every hospital committee, including those that deal with disciplinary issues, peer review issues, and granting and removal of hospital privileges for physicians and allied professionals. We also have served as presidents of medical staff, a position elected to by physician colleagues, and physician members, actually one of our DPMs served as a physician chair of the board of directors at a local community teaching hospital. And uh, we have numerous uh, podiatric physicians serving wow. on hospital boards of directors. Currently, we have a, a DPM as a physician member on the uh, MedStar, uh, MedStar Health Board of Directors and on their Professional Affairs and Quality and Safety Committee. Um, it's, it's interesting to me that the foot and ankle sub, uh, orthopedic foot and ankle subgroup have pushed back in the title change of podiatrist to podiatric physician when they have confidence enough to refer to us for care, their most at-risk patients. These patients are sick with life and limb life threatening infections. They can do that, and yet they're opposed to the title change. Uh, that's something that, that I, I find difficult to understand. Um, we also uh, uh, would ask you to look at some of the letters of support from our physician our colleagues and hospital administrators. Um, the objection of the Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society seems to be nothing more than a turf issue. I respectfully request you to vote favorably on Senate Bill 169. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today. Thank you, Dr. Martirana. Martir uh, so I just wanna flag for colleagues, the Maryland Department of Health Office of Government Affairs seems to be on our list as both favorable and unfavorable. It appears that they are unfavorable to this, uh, but we are waiting on clarification on that um, from committee staff. Uh, there is written testimony from Hush Blackwell Strategies that is favorable, and we have two unfavorable witnesses that will be testifying next, Laura Lee Ma and Jean Ransom, both with MedKai. Mr. Ransom, why don't you kick us off? Good afternoon. Thank you, Vice Chair Kagan and committee members. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I want to start by saying MedKai does oppose this bill, but by no means do we oppose podiatrists. Podiatrists are a really important a wonderful part of the healthcare system. As was stated correctly, my members work side by side with them all the time. In fact, uh, last year, my daughter had some trouble with dance with her feet and I took my daughter right to a podiatrist who did a wonderful job. Uh, didn't even think twice about it actually. So this really isn't about a scope issue. They're absolutely right about this. This is really about a word. The word physician is only for medical doctors and my members overwhelmingly believe that it should only be used by physicians, medical doctors, and osteopaths. Uh, in the 10 years that I've been the CEO of MedKai, I've encouraged MedKai to try to work things out. The problem is it's really hard to work out one word when there's a strong disagreement and belief. And I don't know how you compromise or work through this. Uh, and I'm sympathetic to what they said, but really I think this is one of those issues where there's just a fundamental difference. I'm not going to read the written testimony that was submitted by the AMA, the Maryland Orthopedic Association, or MedKai in opposition. You all have that. Uh, I just want to say one thing, I guess. Um, having former been an elected official, I was thinking about it in these terms. If the House of Delegates passed a bill saying that um, they wanted to call themselves senators, and they argued that they put bills in just like senators do, and they get elected in very similar districts just like senators do, and they do the same thing, how would you feel about it? Uh, and I think you'd be concerned. Does it really matter? No, everybody's a member of the General Assembly and you all work side by side. Uh, but it, there is a fundamental difference in the word. And that's how my members feel. That's why they feel this way. It's not about any of you personally. It's not about the situation that we're in. It's about the fact that this word has real meaning to them uh, and it's their identity. And that's the problem we're in today. 
and I don't know how to solve it. And I guess that's why we pay the members of the health and education committee here to, to the big bucks to solve these kind of problems. So I thank <laughs> you for that. In closing, I also wanted to thank your staff, uh, Senator Kagan and, and Senator Pinsky at EG. They were very helpful in this new process as we've been having difficulties and adjustments. They've done a great job and been very helpful. So I just wanted to say that as well. Thank you, Mr. Ransom. It's good to see, it's good to have you here. And I just wanna share and clarify that the thanks go to our committee staff who does an extraordinary job led by Lamoria Stanton. Uh, Laura Lima, please uh, share your thoughts. Hi, um, thank you very much. Can you guys hear me all right? We hear you well, thank fine. You, thank you, Vice Chair Kagan, Senator Pinsky, and the rest of the members of the committee. It's an honor to be able to speak with you, uh, albeit virtually. Uh, and I'm hoping everybody can hear me well. I'm Lorelai Ma, I'm the president-elect of MedChi, and I am a practicing radiologist. I came out here in 1991 uh, to do my radiology residency and fellowship at Hopkins, and I stayed in the community. My children are here and my family is here uh, in the Baltimore area. Um, I am testifying in opposition to this bill, Senate Bill 169. I do believe that patients have an understanding of the title of physician to be an MD or DO. To give this title to other providers confuses the training and level and type of practice of healthcare providers with MDs and DOs versus other types of providers who are very good providers but are not quite the same as MDs or DOs. A physician has historically been defined as one who's trained in the anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, health, and treatment of the entire patient. After completing the bachelor's degree, which we talked about being before, um, an MD or DO completes four years of medical school, which begins with anatomy and physiology of the entire patient in year one. And then in the second year, pathophysiology of the body and performance of the physical examination. That year, pharmacology also begins, so we understand how to you know, administer medications and differential diagnosis of disease from the patient physical and from laboratory and other uh, tests. In years three and four, the clinical rotations begin in force, pediatrics, family practice, internal medicine, general surgery, all in, in caring for the entire patient. We also do our subspecialty rotations at that time, and that's when we start to see what we like to do and what we might go into. After we obtain the MD, so that's after the four years, we do an additional year of internship. That can be an internal medicine or general surgery or a mixture called the transition year where they do some medical and some surgery. And that is also done treating the patient as a whole. And only after this rigorous uh, training in patient care, we do our specialty training and that's residency. And it's true that I think in the state of Maryland, one year is necessary in order to practice, but it's very typical for people to do at least two to five years of residency and thereafter one to two years of fellowship, such as I did a year after fellowship after my four years of radiology residency. And you know, my daughter, um, I love the state of Maryland. My daughter is a fourth year medical student at the University of Maryland and was gonna stay in the, Mar in the state of Maryland. Her fiance is from the Eastern shore. And so I believe the family is gonna settle somewhere between Baltimore and the Eastern shore. And, uh, and you know, I'm very happy uh, obviously to have her nearby. I'm glad she wanted to go into medicine like I did. I think I did something right, I hope. But I also do think even stronger, having seen all that she went through and all the new things that she's had to learn more than I did. I'm more than I did in the 80s and 90s, that it is, it is, you know, it is a special, it is a unique title, MD and DO. And I feel that this training is unique. It was actually interesting to me in this era of COVID and other public health emergencies that may come in the future, and I'm hoping none do, but you know, this state did somewhat better than some states such as New York or California or Massachusetts. But in many of those states, uh, surgeons started working in the ERs or they started working in the ICUs. Anesthesiologists, instead of doing elective procedure anesthesiology, they started in the ICUs, not just intubating patients, but doing patient care. Oh, okay. Am Mom, I getting close? Ask you to, okay. yes. well, no, you, yes. you need to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So first off, your daughter has obviously uh, Cho chosen well to fall in love with a Marylander and stay here. So that's great. I'm sure that's wonderful for your family. Um, that concludes the opposing testimony. I wanna clarify and thanks to the committee staff. There are three different sheets of paper with three different sets of testimony on this bill, all from the Maryland Department of Health, which was why it was confusing uh, the, um, 
the Board of Podiatric Medical Examiners supports the bill. The Board of Chiropractic Examiners supports the bill. The uh, Board of Physicians opposes this bill. So they have all submitted testimony and that's why it was confusing possibly in your uh, folders or online. So with that, uh, I see that Senator Washington has a question. Please, Senator Washington. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank, thank you all uh, for all the work you do to the health of, of Marylanders. Um, I'm trying to, and this is for the opponents, I, I'm trying, because there was an assertion made by the proponents that your, the training that you have a similar model, four, four, and three. Um, and then, you know, I'm doing some quick sort of looking and I'm trying to understand. So there, there is, a, it's four years of undergrad, you know, four years of school. How many, years, it seems like a similar number of years of medical school. And then it does look to me, and I, again, I just want to understand, um, uh, it looks like there is a couple of years required. Of, there's a residency training uh, requirement. And, and, and also there's a licensing and board certification. So um, while I laughed at the analogy between senators and, um, and delegates, I don't, I, I, I don't think it's the it's, it's same, um, but I, I, I really am trying to see the difference. I also see lots of references to podiatric physician. He showed us a name tag that it's, he's considered a, a physician in, in, common, in common practice. Um, so I, I really need to fully understand if you know, I try to... may, may, may I say something? Yeah, yeah, I mean, may I help to answer the question? Thank you. Absolutely. And, and huh? I, I apologize. So, and, and I, I, I didn't get to say it in my remarks. I, I think one of the differences would be that during that four years of medical school, you're training and care of the entire patient versus a portion of the body of the patient. And in other words, so that four years, you know, you're, you're, care you're learning about, you know, the lungs, the heart, the GI tract, the brain, you know, the skeletal system, everything. And, and that's what can allow people sometimes in these public health emergencies to switch between them because you have actually done the full physician training for the four years and an additional year of internship, was a, which is a more independent practice of being a physician after you've done the four years of training. So I think that's a little bit different in terms of, I think the podiatric scope in terms that they are doing the, I think the foot and the ankle. Now, I, I apologize if I'm wrong about some of that part because I don't yeah. know your exact. Just one other, one other point. Dr. Lewis made it actually. I think when he testified that there was this discussion or is this discussion at the national level about the the similarity and there are negotiations ongoing. Uh, I didn't bring that up in the testimony necessarily because we did bring it up last year, hoping it was going to be resolved and it wasn't. And we don't want to be disingenuous and try to just delay this again. I think sometimes you get to a point where things just need to be voted on, honestly. And maybe that's where we are on this and people just need to take sides and go forward. Um, you know, There will probably be a point when the training and education are very similar that the orthopedic folks uh, are more comfortable with some podiatrist being allowed to be in. I, I also, maybe Richard or one of the doctors can explain this, could also talk about who's grandfathered in and who isn't. Um, these training rules, I, I don't know exactly how long they've been in place and they'd probably be better suited to answer those. Okay, hey, uh, we have some other questions, but uh, unfortunately the witnesses cannot ask questions. Any senators who have questions? Well, well could, I, could I ask the witness, just as a follow-up to my, to my question, um, I, I want, I'd love to hear a response to the response, just because I have no way of evalu evaluating uh, their training. Okay. So it could either be Mr. Lilly. Can you speak to that very briefly? Thank you, Madam Chair. Washington. Dr. Lowy, you'll need to unmute yourself. There you go. Yep. Uh, so we have training in our education. What the uh, incoming president has stated regarding the first two years of our education, identical. And as the and as the second year leads into the third and fourth years, we transition into clinical rotations. My rotations were in general surgery, orthopedics, vascular, and internal medicine at the hospital. So our rotations, uh, I was on the same rotations with medical students. My first two years of school, the pathophysiology, anatomy, 
everything was identical to what the vice uh, incoming president has stated. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Washington. I see no other questions. That concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 169. Going back to the chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, Senator Young, we're coming back to you in Senate Bill 183. Um, uh, in addition to Senator Young, we will hear from Brett Lininger, Susan Adams, Nahan Office, and Angela Mazoma. Uh, thank there's you. One, uh, yep. There is one unfavorable from uh, Maryland Department of Health. Senator. Yep. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, Mr. Chairman, if you could or don't mind, uh, Susan Adams would actually like to go first in testimony. So, uh, okay, um, this bill would enter Maryland into the audiology and speech language pathology interstate compact, and it would establish a formal legal relationship among states to address a common purpose. Uh, this bill would increase access to care for patients, clients, and students, and it would help to facilitate continuity of, continuity of care for uh, patients, uh, clients, and students uh, that relocate or travel to another compact member state. It promotes cooperation between the ASLPIC, the, the compact member states, uh, on interstate licensure and regulation requirements, and ensures that audiologists and speech language pathologists meet acceptable standards of practice. Uh, again, the compact would recognize the license of um, the audi audiologists and speech language pathologists in other states that meet the requirements of the interstate combat pact and would allow for active duty military personnel or their spouses to practice in Maryland. Uh, currently six states have uh, entered into the, audi the compact. The, um, there are 13 other states hearing it uh, this year. It would take 10 for the compact to become uh, active. There are currently uh, more than 200 active interstate compacts. 22 of them are national in scope. Uh, and this one uh, would be that. Um, in case anybody asks, there's only uh, one state presently uh, contiguous to Maryland and that's uh, West Virginia. Uh, in recent years, Maryland's entered into several interstate compacts uh, for nurses and uh, my physical therapist bill from two years ago. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to our witnesses and hope that you act favorably upon it. Okay, uh, Ms. Adams. Um, uh, we can't hear you, Miss Adams. You don't show being muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Young, uh, Chair Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan. My name is Susan Adams. I am yeah. the Director of State Legislative and Regulatory Affair Affairs for the American Speech Language Hearing Association. Um, ASH has been working on this audiology and speech language pathology interstate compact since 2017. Um, and we've been working on it with the Council of State Governments, um, which every state is a member of and it's a nonpartisan organization. They have the National Center for Interstate Compacts, uh, where they have helped numerous other professions, including ours, um, spearhead these efforts to create healthcare licensure compacts so that um, our members will have an easier way to provide services and that those with communication disorders have an easier um, path to receiving services. Um, in developing this compact, we met with state licensing boards, state associations, many outside stakeholders. Um, it was given out to anybody who wanted to comment on it, but was able to comment before it, uh, we finalized our language. Um, we've had hundreds of meetings and webinars. We have the support of university programs, state associations and national organizations such as the American Heart Association and the Council for Exceptional Children among others. Um, the Department of Defense themselves are strong supporters of interstate compacts and have made the inclusion of compacts one of their priorities for state legislatures. 
Um, they even included money in the National Defense Authorization Act this year to create more compacts because it is so favorable for assistance to military spouses. We understand that we have some opposition from other groups. Um, and, and we find that interesting given that most of these other groups have their own interstate compacts and oppose ours. Um, and, you know, Maryland is a member of, of three other healthcare licensure compacts, as Senator Young mentioned the uh, Physicians Compact, the Nursing Compact, and the PT Compact. Our compact is modeled against the PT Compact, so it's nearly identical in how it work, operates. Um, <laughs> so we hope that you will give us a uh, favorable um, report and pass our compact out. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Adams. Uh, let's go to um, Brett Leninger. Mr. Leninger, are you with us? Okay, we'll come back to you. Uh, Nahali Kalfas, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Nahali Kalfas. I'm legal counsel with the Council of State Governments. Uh, I am here in that capacity, but in addition, I've served as both a prosecutor and general counsel for uh, the Speech Language Pathology and Licensing Board in North Carolina for the past 16 years, almost 17. And uh, this gives me a unique perspective on what a compact can do for the field of public protection. Um, the thing that is most uh, interesting to me about this compact, like the other three that your state has had the prescience to join, is that it also creates the appropriate balance between safe public protection and eliminates unduly burdensome regulations and helps us with the disparate requirements that we see the lack of uniformity from state to state. So I think no time in history has the issue of providing access to care and lifting uh, unduly burdensome regulation been more uh, important. And I think that this time in history is showing to be very favorable for these compacts. We've noticed a trend across the country, even states, uh, a number of states that were previously adamantly opposed to healthcare compacts have joined and are um, looking favorable to join. And those typically tend to be pro-union, uh, very strong union states. And they're turning toward compacts as well because we've seen throughout COVID the need to provide access to care. These professions of speech language pathology and audiology want to provide the same access and continuity of care to their patients that doctors, that physicians, that nursing, the nursing profession that physical therapists enjoy now. You heard earlier, uh, I was glad to hear from the uh, occupational therapy compact. I was a primary drafter on this compact as well as the occupational therapy compact, uh, two great groups to work with. These compacts all function in very much the same way, um, almost identical ways. And as um, my colleague Susan mentioned, uh, the, the physical therapy compact did really inform our drafting. So if, you, if you're familiar with that, it is very much the same. These mutual recognition models that both PT and OT and speech language pathology and audiology utilize have been actually acknowledged by the Federal Trade Commission as an effective way to ameliorate antitrust concerns. Um, and I find that very helpful, particularly my work as a general counsel. Um, I respect the time of this committee, I do wanna speak very quickly to some points that have been brought up in the past. And we have had the opportunity to respond to some concerns, both via email and our very long and very involved uh, vetting with stakeholders process. We've been able to what? respond in part to some, just to some misunderstandings with regard to how compacts work. And I do wanna uh, confirm to, to this committee that uh, this compact, like all the other compact, certainly respects the best practices of transparency, of open meetings, uh, providing records to the public of notice and an opportunity to be heard throughout all commission meetings through rulemaking. And that though each state that joins the compact does need to cede a bit of authority, the only ceding of Maryland's authority is in the very narrow area of in making sure that we have properly uh, put the compact in place, 
that we are administering it properly. We don't touch within a compact, never, none of the compacts really touch the scope of practice. That is not within the purview of a compact. A, a compact is really a contract and a constitutional, uh, constitutionally allowed compact. And what these instruments do is they make sure that we do retain some states' rights. Uh, they are creatures of states' rights. So very federal, federalist notion that allows for a state to maintain the scope of practice, hold that they can have with their board, but it does require that the states cede uh, the ability to act unilaterally. You can't, no one state in a compact can act unilaterally against the other states. Uh, just like within your, within all the other compacts, you must act as a group uh, with regard to, again, that narrow field of administering the compact. And just like a state board, you may not promulgate rules or engage in activity that is not specifically authorized by the compact. Calfis, you have to wrap it up, please. No problem. And, and actually, I would be happy to just uh, be available for questions on details of the compact and hope for a favorable outcome. No, 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 Thank you very much. Um, Angela Mazoma. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and committee members. My name is Dr. Helen Angela Mazomo. I am a licensed certified speech language pathologist. I've been working in the field for over 30 years. I'm here representing the Maryland Speech Language Hearing Association. During the time that I have worked, I've provided services in New York, New Jersey, as well as Maryland. And one of the things we've heard repeatedly throughout this afternoon is the impact that the pandemic has had on various service provision. Beyond that, we have therapists who have been treating students who live in Maryland, but they were going to school perhaps in a non-public school in Pennsylvania. That's where they were getting their services. But once they returned to Maryland due to the pandemic, they no longer had access to their primary speech language pathologist. Until the revisions or provisions were made for teletherapy, these students had no way to access their services. We also had therapists who were working in one state and living in another. And then when they had to stay in their home state, had they not gotten their license in their home state, they weren't able to continue to provide services. So what we've seen with the opportunity that this compact can present to us is that continuity of services that we would have a greater level of consistency among the different states when we have a, a student in Delaware who perhaps could benefit from the services of a speech language pathologist in Maryland, they would be able to help provide those services. If we have a, a student in Maryland who could benefit from the services of a therapist in Delaware, because they have a particular expertise, they would have that privilege to practice. Right now, as my own personal experience, as I went through three different states, I had to obtain my license in each state. There was an incredible lag in my getting my license. Sometimes it was waiting on paperwork from the first state on which I obtained my license, but other times it was waiting for the licensing board in the state where I was applying to respond. It took me over five months to get my Maryland state license. I had had my New York and New Jersey license for well over 10 years. It wasn't a question about my credentials or my education. It was a matter of the time it was taking for the licensing board to be able to respond. Having the compact in place would allow people the privilege to come in and practice while they're waiting for their license to be honored. We've also spoken quite a bit about the military families and their spouses. Many of those families have children who receive services and the having the compact in place would allow for those children to continue to receive serving, receiving services from the primary speech language pathologist that they were used to. Establishing rapport with some of these children is very difficult. Why would we want to put an additional burden on that family, on that child, to have to learn? Dr. A Dr. Mazomo, you have to uh, wrap up. We're at our time. I just encourage you to support and have a favorable vote for this compact. Thank you. Okay, uh, questions for uh, the sponsor or his panelist, uh, Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Senator Young for this bill and all the presenters. Um, so I would like a little civic, civics lesson. So we know about federal laws uh, covers all the states uh, in the union. We know about state laws cover uh, all the subdivisions in the state. Um, we're hearing about a compact now. That term is used a lot. 
So what, where does compact fit in with federal laws and state laws? Um, I can't hear you, Senator. You're muted, Senator Young. Um, it is an agreement between all the states uh, to meet certain levels of uh, service delivery so that when people move from state to state that are covered by, by the compact, uh, they have already been approved, so to speak, and can practice their, their uh, profession in those states. Um, I don't, it doesn't supersede any other law. It's just an agreement uh, that the state accepts this compact as part of their law in the sense that uh, it covers the people that live here and covers those that come from other states that have mutually agreed to the compact. Okay. And what's the advantage of a compact versus say uh, going to our federal elected officials since they passed this law for everyone? Well, I guess that is a solution, but I think you also know how difficult it is to get a federal law passed. Uh, but these are all people of the same profession who are agreeing in the compact to the same standards of, of operation and service. And uh, it is a way for those states that wish to participate uh, to join. Some states wish not to, uh, and they decide that they wanna stay within their own boundaries and with their own people, and thus they don't join the compact. And what's the minimum amount of uh, states required to have a compact? It, it requires 10 for the compact to become active. Okay, great. Thank you. Certainly. Uh, let me ask you a question. It's my understanding that a home state cannot pursue adverse action from another state, but they can refuse them the right to practice in their state. Is that correct? Well, I see one of the panelists wants to answer that, so I'll let her. Uh, Ms. Kalfas. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, so how, how the compact works is the home state uh, is the mechanism by which your ticket gets punched to have the privilege to practice in any other state, much like your driver's license, which is a, also a compact. Um, so if there is disciplinary action within the compact member states, if there's disciplinary action in any member state, each and every member state can absolutely take away that privilege for uh, any member any practitioner who chooses to join the compact to practice in their state, much like if you uh, have your Maryland driver's license, but speed in Virginia, they can choose to, to not allow you to have driving privileges in Virginia. Same notion, there are certain uh, items within the compact wherein absolutely the privilege is lost in every single state. Um, the, the, the interesting part of the compact is you have a broader prosecutorial net when you're a member of a compact because the, the compact members report back to a database and the state of Maryland can act upon someone's license or privilege in accordance with your state's due process laws based on what occurred in another state. So right. you can, let, yeah. let me interrupt. Sure. It's my understanding, only the home state can take adverse actions regarding the license. So in other words, if someone behaves badly, does a bad practice in our state, and they're from Idaho, we can say you're no longer welcome here, and Idaho may or may not take an adverse action and, and maybe threaten their license or put them on probation. Is that correct? You are absolutely correct, and the reason for that is because you can only take away what you can give, and within this mutual recognition compact, the uh, other member states, not a home state, only give a privilege. The home state gives a license. So if you give a license, you take away a license. If you give a privilege, you may take it away. And let me ask this, and I think this is one of the fundamental questions and it comes up with many compacts. Let's say we have a, a certain standard in our state and we don't feel someone's meeting it. And we feel maybe they're even doing harm. But in their home state, that's okay. And you know they're less likely to 
I hate to call it prosecute, take adverse action against one of their own when they felt Maryland was being unreasonable. So, you know, that's a concern. In a number of areas, Maryland has fairly high standards. Not that other states don't, um, but the question of holding to those standards and having the expectations in our sister brother states uh, is a question mark. So could you speak to that briefly? Absolutely. Um, so the there's a uniform set of criteria to allow an applicant to the compact to be able to, to get the privilege in every other member state. So that uniform set of criteria was agreed upon by the stakeholders. And it's typically somewhere sort of in the middle. What that uniform set of criteria does not cover is scope of practice. So often when some states have concerns, maybe they have additional requirements for let's say a particular type of practice like swallowing theory, uh, therapy, uh, fiber endoscopic swallowing therapy. For instance, a, a practitioner coming into the state of Maryland would have to acquaint themselves with and be competent in those additional scope of practice areas that Maryland retains the ability to say we have an expectation uh, that isn't one of these uniform set of criteria, that's an extra area of practice and we expect you to meet that. And they are, they are required to do that. And if they don't, they cannot practice in your state and they will not qualify for a privilege in your state. Okay, and final question, uh, Ms. Kalfas, are you speaking for yourself or for the Council of State Governments? Council of State Governments. They yes. endorse this, okay. As, as legal counsel for Council of State Governments. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let's go to the opposition. Um, Candace Robinson. Ms. Robinson, are you this? Good afternoon, uh, Chair and Committee. Thank you. Uh, I'm Candace Robinson. I am the Executive Director for the Board of Audiologists, Hearing Aid Dispensers, and Speech Language Pathologists. And I am also an audiologist. Um, the board of, of, and I'm gonna call this AHS for short, the board of AHS respectfully wishes to point out concerns that we have regarding the interstate compact, particularly regarding some of the language, language regarding the laws of the compact superseding those of Maryland. As reported in the previous legislative session, our board believes that the goal of the compact is a very positive one. It aims to address reaching more of those in need of our services via telehealth, particularly in rural areas, and also cuts down on the amount of license applications needed to practice in states outside of a licensee's home state. The concerns that the board has in the bill include clarity on which laws would supersede in the event of disciplinary, disciplinary action against a Maryland licensee. Um, for instance, in section seven, it says this home state shall apply its own state law to determine appropriate action then conversely, in section 14B, it states binding effect of compact and other laws, all laws in a member state in conflict with the compact are superseded to the extent of the conflict. Secondly, there's lack of clarity regarding the acceptable, acceptable forms of criminal history record check requirements. The compact language requires that a home state issuing licensees recognized by the compact would implement procedures for considering criminal history of that applicant. We don't know if those comport with Maryland's procedures or priorities. Um, Maryland requires live scan fingerprint data only, which is the most complete data to use for the purpose of obtaining a comprehensive criminal records history check. Another state might have different ideas about what to do with the results of that check. Thirdly, the sharing of investigative materials and adverse action information. The requirement that any investigation to be shared with the compact member states violates several provisions of the Public Information Act. Due to the superseding clause, the compact would override state law. Uh, similarly, the provision of the commission shall keep a database that includes adverse actions and investigations, which violates the Public Information Act. Finally, as the compact is written, the board's biggest concern is that the compact supersedes Maryland law in many ways, including the Public Information Act and hiring of nonviolent ex-offenders provisions, for example, and may operate to waive sovereign immunity. For these reasons, the board respectfully requests the committee consider the applicability of the bill to our board and to providing the opportunity for licensees of Maryland the choice to enter into it. Thank you. 
Any questions for the opponent? Seeing none, that concludes the hearing on uh, that piece of legislation. Thank you, Senator Young. Um, now yes. to Senator Riley, 298. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, Senate Bill 298 has come to us because uh, it's been brought to my attention that we've had a number of pharmacy closures across the state of Maryland. There are nine specific regulations about the manner in which a pharmacy must be closed out, including notifying the Board of Pharmacy, controlling uh, the controlled drugs, uh, signage removal, and things of that nature. The piece that's missing is notifying the consumer. When a pharmacy closes, generally they batch up the, far, uh, the prescriptions, send them across town, send them somewhere. But the client may not know it until the phone isn't answered or they go to the facility, to the place, and there's a sign on the door. So we have uh, had a uh, constituent who had this happen. Uh, Mac Middleton will be testifying about uh, Dennis Robin and his experience. But generally, this is a consumer advocacy bill allowing people to control their prescriptions. Many of the pharmacies think it's their asset to sell or to transfer. The reality is your prescriptions are your property. Uh, we mimic this off of uh, the uh, state of Virginia, which has a 30-day advance notice to the uh, consumers uh, in discussing uh, the issues with our local pharmacies. They've requested and I've agreed to reduce the number of days of notice from 30 to 14. Uh, we've requested the amendment. You it should be in our hands in the next few days, but as many of us know, uh, ELS is a little bit behind in their um, processing of uh, amendments. But uh, some of the um, folks who were testifying in opposition a couple days ago, with this uh, amendment of 14 days are now supporting the bill with amendment. Um, I'd like to introduce some, some, uh, someone to you that you may be very familiar with, former chairman and uh, a good friend of mine, Mac Middleton. Mac, are you with us? There you are. Yeah, gotta unmute myself. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, Madam Chairman, and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify on well, this bill, which is really, really important to me because it's named after one of my very, very best friends. For the record, I'm Mac Middleton. I'm not here today as a, a government affairs person for Cornerstone, but here is a citizen and a best friend to, to Dennis Robin. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, bill is very, very important to me because uh, uh, I knew who Dennis Robbins was. He was a very, really great friend. I first met him back in 1970 when we were both stationed in Germany. He was a roommate to my former roommate from college, Jack Furman, and through him, uh, we became good friends and throughout the years we have remained in touch. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, just before um, Dennis passed away in uh, late 2020, one of the last conversations that I had with him was um, that uh, Senator Raleigh was naming this bill after him because of the work that he had done on it and that he wanted to make sure that I helped Senator Raleigh get the bill through. So. That's the purpose of why I'm here today. Uh, after we finished up with the Army, Dennis went to law school. And after graduation, he came to the Maryland General Assembly. He was a reader, uh, a bill reader in the House of Delegates. And uh, from there, he got promoted to legislative services. And finally, he went to work for uh, Governor Harry Hughes as one of his legislative people uh, on his legislative team. And uh, after he finished that, uh, he probably could have gotten a great job because he did such a great job that uh, a lot of times uh, our great analysts and others get picked up by the hospital association and others. He probably could have gotten picked up, but he decided to go back to Crofton and he opened up his law practice and he had the law practice until the last year that uh, he lived. Um, you know, I talked uh, the other day to uh, Bobby Neal, former, former Secretary of Health Neal, former Senator Neal, former House of Delegates member, Neil, uh, if he remembered Dennis when he worked here, and he said, absolutely, he remembered him. Uh, and he had nothing but kind things about, about him. He said he was very, very uh, a hard worker. He was very, very fair to both Democrats and Republicans. He was very, very professional, very, very competent. 
And uh, the reason why this, uh, uh, this bill is so important is that uh, in his last uh, couple of years of life, Dennis was struggling with cancer and a severe heart ailment. And uh, he had uh, his prescriptions through a local pharmacy there. And uh, he went to pick up his prescription one day only to find out that uh, they were out of business. And uh, just imagine uh, the difficulty this presents to people, especially elderly people, senior citizens, and people with these uh, underlying health conditions that not knowing where your records are, not knowing what uh, uh, pharmacy is going to take your, your prescriptions. So, uh, you know, being the astute uh, person that knows how legislation worked, he checked the law to see if, in fact, he should have been notified, found that he wasn't, and therefore he went right to work to make sure that there was a piece of legislation, and he contacted Senator Raleigh. And, uh, and that's the story. And last conversation that I had with Dennis, he said, you know, I probably will never benefit from this, but there'll be consumers like me that will follow me that will benefit from benefit from it. So, um, you know, I just uh, hope that the bill will, that the committee will look favorably on this bill and give it a favorable recommendation. I'll be happy to answer any questions when we finish. And I certainly want to thank Senator Raleigh for, uh, as a, we became mutual friends through Dennis for picking up this legislation and moving forward with it. Mr. Chair, yeah, committee, any questions Mr. for Senator Riley or Senator, Senator Middleton? Uh, I have one. Um, if a pharmacy goes out of business, what kind of remedy do you have if the person who's closing the pharmacy either so consumed with going out of business because of financial problems with them filling all of the requirements of the bill. I, I, I'm just trying to figure out someone, they're below water and they're drowning and they have debt and they close the pharmacy. I would assume most people of goodwill will forward to their name of another pharmacy. I can also imagine some situations where people are going under and are not thinking about that. So I guess my question is, how do we handle enforcement? I mean- yeah, I can share that information with you, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Uh, you can imagine that uh, there have been several lobbyists who work with different pharmacy groups who've contacted me. And the, um, you know, you learn an awful lot when you submit legislation. Uh, their testimony to me is that the vast majority of these pharmacies, especially the small independent pharmacies, end up selling their block of customers to a larger firm. So for instance, this one um, at a shopper's grocery store had a shopper's pharmacy. They closed it down and they sent all the prescriptions over to CVS, which was about four miles away. And Mr. Robin didn't want anything to do with CVS. Um, they look, the closing pharmacy looks at these prescriptions as an asset, which they want to transfer and be compensated for it. And as a small business owner for 43 years, I get it. But that's a short-sighted issue because they don't own those prescriptions. The prescriptions are owned by the customer. So generally, uh, about 95% of the time, they tell me, this transfer of the prescriptions occur the closing pharmacy gets compensated. And um, I'm not concerned if the closing pharmacy sends out the uh, notice or the receiving pharmacy sends out the notice as long as it's done. I have to share with you, Mr. Chairman, when I reviewed the nine subsections of the regulations, they talk about signage, they talk about notifying the board, they talk about uh, information and procedures, uh, about uh, what to do with their inventory, what to do with their controlled substances and things of that nature. Um, the, this closing of a pharmacy is very prescriptive and these pharmacies will be following these prescriptive issues. I don't think they're closing a door and walking away without a penny in their pocket, but I'm not concerned if it's the closing pharmacy or the acquiring pharmacy, somebody's got to notify uh, the clientele uh, we do have a letter in the packet from um, Patricia O'Connor from uh, the Office of the General Attorney General, and her two final lines of her letter are, we believe the bill will improve protections for consumers against abrupt closures without notice, 
or those occurring with inadequate notice to consumers. For final sentence, the notice is critical for customers needing to find alternative pharmacies to fill prescriptions. That's the intent. Uh, it's, it's being done in many other uh, states with a, a great deal of success and would like to bring this uh, notification policy here to the state of Maryland. Well, I appreciate your use of the word prescriptive um, given the uh, subject matter. Um, <laughs> Very good. So you would not have a problem if we have some amendments to, uh, no. No. if it is being uh, transferred, sold to another entity uh, of clarifying that someone has the, the responsibility and the accountability for, for doing this. I leave the bill in the hands, the wisdom of the hands of the committee. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, other questions for the proponents, if not, Yes, uh, yes, Senator Kagan. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was just going to, you beat me to it. Uh, Senator Riley, you may or may not know that the chair and I are both big punsters. So welcome to the <laughs> pharmacy bill. I love it. I understand. Glad to be here. <laughs> to uh, Ms. Locklear, uh, opposition. I shouldn't be signed up in opposition. I should be signed up uh, in support with amendments. Uh, nevertheless, <laughs> Kaylee Locklear here on behalf of the Maryland Chain Drug Store Association. Thanks for the opportunity to testify again today. And thanks to Senator Riley for working with us on this legislation. As he discussed, um, we pointed out to him that most states actually have a 14 day closure notification instead of 30 days. He agreed to support that. We really hope uh, the committee will agree to support that as well because that um, means we can support it as well. And I wanna talk about why that's important. Um, delays due to other requirements that he mentioned earlier that come from both the DEA as well as the Board of Pharmacy. Um, they have requirements such as inspections, prescription and information transfers and sharing that information with the DEA uh, specifically can slow a closure down. Uh, thus, the notification at 14 days really does provide a more accurate time when the pharmacy will be closed. 30 days, a lot can happen there in scheduling um, and transferring information, which is why so many states have gone with 14 days. Uh, we would uh, like to work with you on any other amendments on the legislation, um, but we would urge the committee to adopt the amendment that we've discussed and support the legislation. Thanks. Uh, I have a question, follow-up question, Ms. Locklear. Uh, given the conversation Senator Riley and I just had about someone being responsible for ensuring that the 14-day notice goes out, and if it is sold to another retailer, um, if we're more explicit in the bill to say who is responsible and who knows if there'll be a penalty or not, but there, there's, there's gotta be some assurity that this oversight and this gets implemented. One of the things that I think is important that Senator Riley um, put on the bill. So with the notification, you're putting something on the door and then you also have to put it on your website if you have a website. And uh, there are requirements in there, the date of the anticipated closing of the pharmacy, the name of the pharmacy to which the pharmacy closing is going to transfer those prescriptions has to be on the website and on that notification as well. Um, so I hope that that's helpful in addressing that problem. And as always, by the way, a consumer can always transfer their prescriptions at any time with a pharmacy. I, I can't speak to the more local or independent pharmacies that I think you're referencing. Obviously, my members that are chain drugstores in the state have a significant presence here. Um, so you're kind of always going to be able to track them down. But a more local pharmacy or a single store that's closing, uh, that could be very challenging um, to penalize them after. But I think what we're trying to do here is provide notification in a time period for consumers by which if they want to transfer that prescription somewhere else, they can go ahead and do so and just provide that information to consumers. Uh, 
Well, can't hear you. Seeing, seeing no further questions, that concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 298. We're down to two bills, ladies and gentlemen. We're almost there. Um, we're moving to Senator Washington, Senate Bill, <clears throat> excuse me, 313. Uh, witnesses following Senator Washington are Marlon Taylor, Eric Coltamiro, and Nancy Rodriguez Weller. And there is no opposition to the bill, you know, at least currently in the bill file. Senator Washington. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairman. Thank you, Committee. I will just do a quick stretch and just get excited about this opportunity to, um, you know, provide a public health outreach program on the issue of cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's disease, and other types of dementia. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chairman Pinsky, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of the committee. I'm speaking with you today about a, a really important issue that, again, as we age, that our population ages, um, that many, many of us are are interacting with and many, many more of us are going to experience. But the truth of the matter is we don't really know a lot about it um, in the general public and even um, you know, families that are, that are dealing with these issues, such as mine, such as some of the, the colleagues I'm going to raise uh, later on. We don't know a lot about how we can provide the services and how we can get uh, the, the, the support that we need. So I'm asking for your strong support of SB 13. Uh, this legislation did pass the House in 2020. Um, so you're, and we did hear it, and you're going to hear uh, the, this again today. Um, Alzheimer's and dementia is personal to me. Um, it's an um, I am dealing with that as a caregiver um, and responsible person for my mother. Um, also, just recently, a colleague just shared with me uh, about having to place her mother. Um, it's, um, it's also personal to, um, very more publicly to a former colleague of ours, Russian Baker, Russian Baker, who has been a long-term caregiver for his wife, Sis, and who received the diagnosis of early onset dementia over a decade ago. Uh, there was an article in 2012 that talked about it, and it described how the condition first set in, that he and his children didn't really know what was happening. Um, they just thought that she was depressed. Um, her mother wasn't really, she wasn't on top of things. And again, I share this story because this is so similar to what so many of us see. We, we see there's some confusion. They're forgetting their, the, how to get to the places that you normally get to. You forget to pay your bills. Um, you, don't, you didn't find out until two years later uh, that his wife had Alzheimer's disease. And sadly, the condition is much worse. Um, her story is all too common. Families do not know that their loved ones have dementia. Too many of over the 110,000 Marylanders take far too long to recognize the early signs of this cruel disease. They take too long to get screened, to get into a care treatment plan. The legislation, this legislation, mandates that multiple organizations work together who are currently working to, on this disease, the Department of Health, the Department of Aging, the State Alzheimer's Council, the Alzheimer's Association, that they prioritize um, and, and that we prioritize the health department to put together a partnership that can aid families across Maryland. Um, we're gonna focus, this bill focuses on provider education on Alzheimer's and other dementia. I'm grateful to MedCi, they are in support of this legislation. It also requires focused outreach to black and Latino communities who are twice as likely and one and a half more times likely, perspective and uh, retrospectively, to be diagnosed with dementia um, than others. Uh, we have to reduce their risk of cognitive decline. Um, as Speaker Jones mentioned, she actually in a tweet, she talked earlier about this, that we have to prioritize raising awareness about health risks in our communities to reduce health disparities. This bill does that. Uh, I wish this bill wasn't necessary, but it is. The number of Marylanders with dementia is expected to grow by over 18% in the next five years. Because of the number of competing priorities we all have, we need legislation to help government prioritize the partnership of these four different organizations who are working in somewhat silos on this issue of Alzheimer's as the broad category 
but more, but uh, as a specific category, but more specifically around cognitive decline that can be the result of stroke and any number um, of, 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 of crisis interventions. It is, it, we acknowledge uh, that the General Assembly can provide this type of leadership. We know that people come to us with so many different issues, but we do have the ability to compel a coordinated focused approach for better care. Uh, the health department uh, has stated in their testimony that you have that they do not have the financial or personal resources to implement this legislation due to the ongoing COVID pandemic. Um, they requesting that this bill be reintroduced in 2020. I respect the career public health staff at the department, yet I believe that by October 1st, that this bill would begin to take effect, that the COVID response will be in a much different place. It may be, it may continue to be burdensome. It may, we may not know the end of it, but so does the onset of this, of this, um, of this disease that is impacting so many Marylanders. Um, as the fiscal note suggests, uh, MDH can hire a qualified health community educator as a contractor. That cost is minimum but the impact would be significant. So I urge the committee to not delay in this important legislation. So you're gonna hear from our sponsor panel. Uh, first, Eric, uh, uh, Eric um, Coltramurio uh, from the Maryland Department of Government Affairs for the Alzheimer's Association, from Ms. Rodriguez Wellers, as you said, she's assistant uh, professor of pharmacy, and then also from Marin Taylor, the family care coordinator. Uh, thank you all very much uh, for your time, and I look forward to your favorable report. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Would you like Eric to go first? Uh, yes, please. That was the, yeah. That. Okay. Eric? Thank you, Chair, Chair Pinsky and Vice Chair Kagan. Eric Kulchmiro here with the Alzheimer's Association, um, here uh, to provide testimony and my strong support for SB 313. There is no known cure for Alzheimer's. Uh, fortunately, there are ways to intervene using public health tools and techniques. The public health approach and the partnership uh, that uh, Senator Washington has described can improve the quality of life for those living with Alzheimer's disease, their caregivers, and reduce costs associated with this disease. This bill is, provides more than just a statement about Alzheimer's and dementia. It provides and allows for concrete steps that this partnership can take, combined community engagement so that there's a focused strategy to reach Marylanders, linkages of ex external resources to streamline public information about this cruel disease, effective internal engagement to local health departments and a common data informed focus. This partnership all told can allow us to Un better understand the prevalence, incidence, and reduce the spread of dementia across Maryland and target outreach communities most at risk. I wanna close and, and Marlon and, and Nancy will offer um, their thoughtful comments after me, but I wanna close actually by just stating the words of others and, and not my words. In advance of this hearing, following um, this bill's passage out of HGO this past Monday, and it's already been voted out of HGO, I reviewed testimony submitted for the House. And I wanna leave you with some of those words of others. The home care, assisted living, and adult day services industry testify, uh, submitted testimony in support, noting that enhanced public awareness was the fourth uh, pillar area of the 2012 state Alzheimer's report. Yet no coordinated campaign has been taken since then. Mayor Brandon Scott in the Baltimore City Health Department wrote that education is an important part of our efforts to reflect the connection between overall health and brain health. And the Mental Health Association of Maryland wrote that they support this legislation as it addresses the epidemic rates of dementia and harnesses the momentum of the Alzheimer's Association, the expertise of the Virginia Jones State Alzheimer's Council, and the networks of the State Department of Health and the State Department of Aging. I thank you for your time and I urge a favorable report. Thank you. Uh, next we'll go to uh, Ms. Uh, Nancy Rodriguez-Weller followed by Marlon Taylor. Okay, uh, good afternoon Chair Pinsky and Vice Chair Kagan and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to speak in support of, of Senate Bill 313. 
Uh, my name is Nancy Rodriguez Weller. I'm a long-term resident of the Eastern Shore of Maryland. I live in Salisbury. I'm also an assistant professor at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore in Princess Anne. I am a senior care consultant pharmacist and a member of Maryland's Virginia I. Jones Alzheimer's Disease and Related uh, Disorders Council. Now on a personal note, both my grandmother and father were diagnosed with dementia. Uh, my first exposure to dementia occurred when I was 12 years old. Um, I met my grandmother for the first time and many years later, 50 years later, my father passed away at the age of 92 years old with the same disease. Now, as Eric pointed out, we don't have a cure for dementia, but we now know that early detection is key to managing this disease. And some of the signs and symptoms of dementia rely on family members or uh, a neighbor, someone reporting or initiating a conversation about the changes in the mood and difficulty that the patient may be having coping with activities of daily life. This bill in question recommends pulling all our resources together to work together. Now living in the Eastern Shore, there are many, many disparities. Uh, people in rural areas, African-American and Hispanic cultures that would benefit from this outreach. There are few resources provided to our older adults and their family members in our area. Now, as an educator, I volunteer my services for free at our local gyms and older adult centers so I can educate our community on the effects of this disease. I am very passionate about it. And a coordinated outreach plan on dementia would especially benefit those who do not recognize these early symptoms of this disease. This is key to individuals and family members who are impacted, not just physically, but financially as well. I wanna thank you and the committee for the opportunity to speak in support of this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rodriguez Weller. Uh, and finally, um, uh, Ms. Marlon Taylor, are you with us? Yes, I am. Uh, thank you, Chair Penske and Vice Chair Keegan. My name is Marlon Taylor, and I am the Family Care Coordinator for the Alzheimer's Association in Maryland. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of SB 313. I joined the Alzheimer's Association because I wanted to be in a position to help families navigate to programs and services that, met, that meet their individual needs. No one in my family has dementia, but as I work with families and conduct care consultations, I hear their burdens and I see the stress and challenges they face as a result of Alzheimer's and other dementias. This legislation includes a specific focus on outreach to the Black and Latino communities who are disproportionately impacted by Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. This is a big part of what I do. This includes directly engaging African-American churches about the association's resources, including our 24 seven helpline for families. It includes our, um, I'm sorry, it includes the uh, African-American Community Forum on Memory Loss, which attracts 400 participants each year and it also includes the first virtual Latino summit, which provided valuable information regarding how Alzheimer's affects the Latino community and highlighted the many Spanish language programs and resources. Although we are still learning why the black and Latino communities have higher rates of Alzheimer's disease, we know that they have higher rates of heart disease, stroke, high blood pressure and high cholesterol which have been linked to Alzheimer's. But I am pleased to be part of the solution. And I am also pleased that this bill requires coordinated outreach to clinicians, as well as effective outreach to the public, not limited to blacks and Latinos, which is really important to me. All too often, one of the worst comments I hear as I conduct care consultations is, I wish I really had known about the Alzheimer's Association. 
before my loved one received their diagnosis as well as after receiving it. I urge a favorable report on SB 313. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Taylor. Um, there is no opposition to the bill, either oral or written. Um, so that concludes the hearing on Senator Washington's bill on uh, Alzheimer education. We go to the final bill of the day, Senator uh, Simon Ayer on um, uh, funeral establishments and crematoriums. Um, it'll be Senator Simon Ayer followed by Verna Lieber. And I would, looking at the witness list, uh, there is neither oral or written opposition. Uh, Senator Simon Ayer, um, you're the you're the cleanup person. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I should be done this in about two hours, and we'll get out of here. So, anyway, um, this bill passed unanimously last year, and we ran out of time in the House, so I will keep it brief. Uh, it is in the same form. This bill simply closes a loophole in our law pertaining to giving unclaimed remains of veterans and appropriate disposition. Uh, I will note, Mr. Chairman, I do have multiple departments writing support letters for this. Um, and I've asked them all just to do writing. And so we have the Department of Veterans Affairs, the Department of Health Board of Morticians and Funeral Directors, 16 veterans organizations, Maryland State Funeral Directors and, and more to come. Uh, last year, I worked collaboratively with the Department of Veterans Affairs, the Maryland State Funeral Directors, and the Board of Martricians to come up with this consensus bill. Uh, Maryland, with uh, many other states, have recently passed wonderful law that allows the notification and appropriate disposition of unclaimed remains of veterans and their eligible dependents. Working with nonprofits such as Missing in America Project, thousands of unclaimed veterans have received proper burial across the nation. Nationally, there were 100,000 unclaimed remains with approximately 25% where our veterans are eligible family members. There is a process if the veterans organization takes the unclaimed remains, but this bill specifies what happens if an organization does not or cannot take the unclaimed remains. In that case, in that case the funeral establishment would notify the Department of Veterans Fair for the transfer to the department for the appropriate disposition of the state vet to the state veteran cemetery. The department advises while limited, they believe enacting this bill would affect 10 unclaimed veterans and eligible veterans family members annually. And we want to ensure that every veteran and eligible dependent is honored and properly buried. I ask for your favorable consideration again. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, is your staff, Ms. Lieber, going to testify or just you? No, it's just me. Okay. Uh, questions for um, Senator Simon Air. Again, as he said, this bill passed the committee last year fairly quickly and it got lost at late in the session in the House. Um, seeing no questions, um, that concludes the hearing on that bill. It also concludes our hearings for the day. Committee, I want to thank all of you for your staying power uh, and staying engaged. Um, so beyond that, I'm not sure what else to say. Tomorrow is a heavy day. We have uh, two, uh, two hearing sessions early and, uh, and then after lunch and then a voting session. So it could be a little late tomorrow. Um, get some rest tonight. Thank you all. Uh, that concludes the hearings for today.